Irish? No! Oh, first! You know Caius Marcius is chief enemy to the people. Yeah. Let's kill him and we'll have corn at our own price. He's the verdict! Yes. We're accounted poor citizens. The patricians, good. Oh, what authority, sir, if it's on, would relieve us? If they would yield us, but the superfluity, while they were wholesome, we might guess they relieved us humanely, yeah. but they think we are too dear. Yeah. The leanness that afflicts us, the object of our misery, is an inventory to particularise their abundance. Yeah. Our sufferance is a gain to them. Let us revenge this with our pikes ere we become rakes. For the gods know, I speak this in hunger for bread, not in thirst for revenge. Would you proceed especially against Caius Martius? Yes. Against him first. He's a very dog to the commonalty. Aye. Consider you what services he has done for his country. Very well. Could be content to give him good report for it. But that he pays himself with being proud! Oh, hey, oh, but speak oh, not maliciously! I say unto you, what he had done famously, he did it to the end! Those soft conscience men can be content to say it was for his country, he did it to please his mother! <laughs> <laughs> and to be partly proud, which he is, even to the altitude of his virtue. What he cannot help in his nature, you are count a vice in him. You must in no way say he is covetous. If I must not, I need not be barren of accusations. He hath faults with surplus to tire in repetition. What shouts are these? The other side of the sea is risen. Why stay we praying here? To the capital! <laughs> Who comes here? Hooray! Hooray! Worthy Menenius Agrippa, one that hath always loved the people. He's one honest enough, but all the rest were so. Uh, what works, my countrymen in hand? Where go you with bats and clubs? The matter, speak, I pray you. Our business is not unknown to the Senate. They have had inkling this fortnight what we intend to do, aye. which now we will show them in deeds. Aye, 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 aye. They say poor suitors have strong breaths. <laughs> they shall know we have strong arms aye. too. Aye. Why, masters, my good friends, my honest neighbours, will you undo yourselves? We cannot, sir. We're undone already. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, friends, most charitable care have the patricians of you. Yeah. All your wants, your suffering in this dearth, you may as well strike at the heaven with your staves as lift them against the Roman state, whose course will arm the way it takes, cracking 10,000 curbs of more strong link asunder than can ever appear in your impediment. For the dearth, the gods, not the patricians, make it. And your knees to them, not arms, must help. <laughs> Alack, you are transported by calamity, thither where more attends you. And you slander the helms of the state, who care for you like fathers. <laughs> Curse them as enemies. Care for us? So oh, true indeed. They ne'er cared for us yet. Aye. Suffer us to famish, Aye. and their storehouses cram with grain. Aye. Make edicts for usury to support usurers. Aye. Repeal daily any wholesome act established against the rich, and provide more piercing statutes daily to chain up and restrain the poor. Aye. If the wars eat us not up, they will. And there's all the love they bear Aye. us. Aye. Either you must confess yourselves wondrous malicious or be accused of folly. I shall tell you a pretty tale. It may be you have heard it, but since it serves my purpose, I will venture to stale to a little more. Well, I hear it, sir, that you must not think to fob off our disgrace with a tale, but I'm pleased you deliver. There was a time when all the body's members rebelled 
against the belly, thus accused it that only like a gulf it did remain in the midst of the body, idle and unactive, still cupboarding the viand, never bearing like labor with the rest, where the other instruments did see and hear, devise, instruct, walk, feel, and mutually participate, did minister unto the appetite and affection common of the whole body. The belly answer... Well, sir, what answer made the belly? <laughs> <laughs> sir, I shall tell you, with a kind of smile, which ne'er came from the lungs, but uh, even thus... <laughs> 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 For look you, I may make the belly smile as well as speak. It tauntingly replied to the discontented members, the mutinous parts that envied his receipt, even so most fitly as you malign our senators, for that they are not such as you. Your belly's answer! What? The kingly crowned head, the vigilant eye, the counsellor heart... The arm, our soldier, our steed, the leg, the tongue, our trumpeter, with other muniments and petty helps in this our fabric. If that they... What then? Pour me this fellow speaks. What then? What then? <laughs> Should by the cormorant belly be restrained, who is the sink or the body... Well, what then? The former agents, if they did complain, what could the belly answer? I will tell you, if you'll bestow a small of what you have little patience a while... <laughs> You steer the belly's answer. Oh, no, you are long about it. Note me this, good friend. Your most grave belly was deliberate, not rash like his accusers, and thus answered, uh, uh, True is it. <laughs> <laughs> My incorporate friends, quoth he, <laughs> that I receive the general food at first, which you do live upon. And fit it is, because I am the storehouse and the shop of the whole body. But, if you do remember, I send it through the rivers of your blood, even to the court, the heart, to the seat of the brain, and through the cranks and offices of man, the strongest nerves and small, inferior veins, from me, receive that natural competency whereby they live. And though that all at once, you, my good friends, this says the belly, mark me. I sir, well, well. Though, the, though all at once cannot see what I do deliver out to each, yet I can make my audit up that all from me do back receive the flower of all. And leave me but the bran. <laughs> what say you to it? It was an answer. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. The senators of Rome are this good belly, and you, the mutinous members. For examine their counsels and their cares, digest things rightly, touching the wheel of the common. You shall find no public benefit which you receive, but it proceeds or comes from them to you, and no way from yourselves. What do you think, you the great toe of this assembly? Why <laughs> <laughs> the great toe? Why the great toe? For that being one of the lowest, basest, poorest <laughs> of this most wise rebellion. Oh. Hey. Thou ghost foremost. <laughs> Thou rascal that at worst in blood to run leads first to win some vantage. But make you ready your stiff bats and clubs. Rome and her rats are at the point of battle. The one side must have bail. Must have bread! Oh, bread. 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 Hail, noble Martius. Thanks. What's the matter, you dissentious rogues, that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs? Oh, we have ever your good words. He that will give good words to thee will flatter beneath abhorring. What would you have, you 
curs that like nor peace nor war. The one that frights you, the other makes you proud. He that trusts to you, where he should find you lions, finds you hares, where foxes geese. You are no surer, no, than is the coal of fire upon the ice or hailstone in the sun. Your virtue is to make him worthy whose offence subdues him and curse that justice did it. Who deserves greatness deserves your hate and your affections are a sick man's appetite who desires most that which would increase his evil. He that depends upon your favours swims with fear fins of lead, and hews down oaks with rushes. Hang ye! Trust ye! With every minute you do change your mind, and call him noble that was now your hate, him vile that was your garland. What's the matter that in these several places of the city you cry against the noble senate who, under the gods, keep you in awe, which else would feed on one another? What's their seeking? For corn at their own rates, whereof they say the city is well stored. Oh, hang them! Hang them. Well stored. They say. They'll sit by the fire and presume to know what's done in the capital. Who's like to rise, who thrives and who declines, side factions and give out conjectural marriages, making parties strong and feebling such as stand not in their liking below their cobbled shoes. They say there's grain enough. Would the nobility lay aside their rules and let me use my sword? I'd make a quarry with thousands of these quartered slaves as high as I could pick my lance. Hey, these are almost thoroughly persuaded. For though abundantly they lack discretion, yet are they passing cowardly. But I beseech you, what says the other troop? They are dissolved. Hang them. They said they were unhungry. Side forth proverbs that hunger broke stone walls, that dogs must eat, that meat was made for mouths, that the gods sent not corn for the rich men only. With these shreds they vented their complainings, which being answered, and a petition granted them, a strange one, to break the heart of generosity and make bold power look pale, they threw their caps as they would hang them on the horns of the moon, shouting their emulation. What is granted them? Five tribunes to defend their vulgar wisdoms of their own choice. One's Junius Brutus, Sicinius Velutus, and I know not. Steth, the rabble should have first unroofed the city ere so prevailed with me. It will in time win upon power and throw forth greater themes for insurrections arguing. This is strange. <laughs> Go get you home, you fragments. Where's Caius Martius? Here. What's the matter? The news is, sir, the Volsies are in arms. I am glad on Then we shall have means to vent our musty superfluity. See? Our best elders. Marcius, it is true that you have lately told us. The Volsies are in arms. They have a leader. Tullus or Phidias, that will put you to it. I sin in envying his nobility. And were I anything but what I am, I would wish me only he. You have fought together. Were half to half the world by the ears, and he upon my party, I'd revolt to make only my wars with him. He is a lion that I am proud to hunt. Then, worthy marches, attend upon Cominius to these wars. It is your former promise. There it is, and I am constant. Titus Lartius, thou shalt see me once more strike at Tullus' face. What? Art thou stiff? Stand'st out? No, Caius Marcius. I lean upon one crutch and fight with t'other. Uh, stay behind this business. Oh, true. Your yeah. company to the capital, where I know our greatest friends attend us. Lead you on. Follow Cominius. We must follow you. Right worthy, you priority. Noble Marcius. Heads! To your homes, be gone. Nay, let them follow. The Volsies have much corn. Take these rats thither to gnaw their garners. Worshipful mutineers, your valour puts well forth. Pray, follow. Was ever man so proud as is this Marcius? He has no equal. When we were chosen tribunes for the people... Mount you his lip and eyes? Nay, but his taunts. <gasps> Being moved, he will not spare to gird the gods. Be mock the modest moon. The present wars devour him. 
He is grown too proud to be so valiant. Such a nature, tickled with good success, disdains the shadow which he treads on at noon. But I do wonder his insolence can brook to be commanded under Cominius. Fame, at the which he aims, in whom already he is well graced, cannot better be held nor more attained than by a place below the first. For what miscarries shall be the general's fault, though he performed the utmost of a man. And Gidesentia will then cry out of Martius, oh, if he had borne the business. Besides, if things go well, opinion that so sticks at Martius shall of his demerits rob Cominius. Come, half all Cominius' honours are to Martius, though Martius earned them not. And all his faults to Martius shall be honours, though indeed in aught he merit not. Let's hence and hear how the dispatch is made, and in what fashion, more than his singularity, he goes upon this present action. Let's along. <laughs> So, your opinion is, Orphidius, that they of Rome are entered in our councils and know how we proceed. Is it not yours? Whatever have been thought on in this state that could be brought to bodily act ere Rome had circumvention. It is not four days gone since I heard thence. These are the words. I think I have the letter here. Yes, here it is. They have pressed a power, but it is not known whether for east or west. The dearth is great, the people mutinous, and it is rumoured Cominius... Marcius, your old enemy, who is of Rome worse hated than of you, and Titus Lartius, a most valiant Roman. These three lead on this preparation with it is bent. Most likely it is for you. Consider of it. Our arm is in the field. We never yet made doubt but Rome was ready to answer us. Nor did you think it folly to keep your great pretenses veiled till when they needs must show themselves, which in the hatching, it seemed, appeared to Rome. By the discovery, we shall be shortened in our aim, which was to take in many towns ere almost Rome should know we were afoot. Noble Aphidius, take your commission. Hie you to your bands. Let us alone to guard Coriolis. If they set down before us for the remove, bring up your army, but I think you'll find they have not prepared for us. Oh, doubt not that. I speak from certainties. Nay more, some parcels of their power are forth already, and only hitherward. I leave your honours. If we and Caius Martius chance to meet, tis sworn between us we shall ever strike till one can do no more. The gods assist you. And keep your honour safe. Farewell. 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 I pray you, daughter, sing or express yourself in a more comfortable sort. If my son were my husband, I should freely rejoice in that absence wherein he won honour than in the embracements of his bed where he would show most love. When yet he was but tender-bodied and the only son of my womb, when youth with comeliness plucked all gaze his way, when for a day of king's entreaties a mother should not sell him an hour from her beholding, I, considering how honour would become such a person, that it was no better than picture-like to hang by the wall, if renown made it not stir, was pleased to let him seek danger where he was like to find fame. To a cruel war I sent him from whence he returned, his brows bound with oak. I tell thee, daughter, I sprang not more in joy at first hearing he was a man-child than now in first seeing he had proved himself a man. But had he died in the business, madam, how then? Then his good report should have been my son. I therein would have found issue. Hear me profess sincerely, had I a dozen sons, each in my love alike, and none less dear than thine and my good Martius, I had rather had eleven die nobly for their country than one voluptuously surfeit out of action. Madam, the Lady Valeria is come to visit you. Beseech you give me leave to retire myself. Indeed, you shall not. Methinks I hear hither your husband's drum. See him pluck Ophidius down by the hair, as children from a bear, the Volsi shunning him. He thinks I see him stamp thus and call thus, Come on, you cowards, 
You were got in fear, though you were born in Rome. His bloody brow with his mailed hand then wiping, forth he goes, like to a harvestman that's tasked to mow or all or lose his hire. His bloody brow. Oh, Jupiter, no blood. Away, you fool. It more becomes a man than guilt his trophy. The breasts of Hecuba, when she did suckle Hector, looked not lovelier than Hector's forehead when it spit forth blood at Grecian sword contemning. Tell Valeria we are fit to bid her welcome. Madam, heavens bless my lord from fell Ophidius. He'll beat Ophidius head below his knee and tread upon his neck. My ladies both, good day to you. Sweet madam. I am glad to see your ladyship. How do you both? Oh, you are manifest housekeepers. What are you sewing here? Oh, a fine spot in good faith. How does your little son? I thank your ladyship well, good madam. He had rather see the swords and hear a drum than look upon his schoolmaster. <laughs> oh, my word, the father's son. <laughs> I'll swear it is a very pretty boy. Oh, my troth. I looked upon him a Wednesday half an hour together. Has such a confirmed countenance. I saw him run after a gilded butterfly, and when he caught it, he let it go again, and after it again, and over and over he comes, and up again, catches it again. Or whether his fall enraged him, or how twas, he did so set his teeth and tear it. Oh, <laughs> I warrant how he mummocked it. One on's father's moves. <laughs> Indeed, Lart is a noble child. A crack, madam. Oh, come, lay aside your stitchery. I must have you play the idle housewife with me this afternoon. No, no, good madam, I will not out of doors. Not out of doors? She shall, she shall. Indeed, no, by your patience. I'll not over the threshold till my lord return from the wars. Fie, you can't find yourself most unreasonably. Come, you must go visit the good lady that lies in. I will wish her speedy strength and visit her with my prayers, but I cannot go thither. Why, I pray you? It is not to save labour, nor that I want love. Oh, you would be another Penelope. Yet they say all the yarn she spun in Ulysses' absence did but fill Ithaca full of moths. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come. I would your cambric were sensible as your finger that you might leave pricking it for pity. Come, you shall go with us. No, good madam, pardon me. Indeed, I will not fall. In truth, La, go with me. And I'll tell you excellent news of your husband. Oh, good madam, there can be none yet. Verily, I do not jest with you. There came news from him last night. Indeed, madam. In earnest, it's true. I heard a senator speak it. Thus it is. The Volsces have an army fought against whom Cominius, the general, is gone with one part of our Roman power. Your lord and Titus Lartius are set down before their city, Coriolis. They nothing doubt prevailing, and to make it brief wars. Oh, this is true, on mine honour. And so I pray, go with us. Give me excuse, good madam. I will obey you in everything hereafter. Let her alone, lady. As she is now, she will but deceive our better mirth. No, oh, in troth, I think she would. Fare you well, then. Oh, come, good sweet lady. Pretty Virginia, turn thy solemnness out of door and go along with us. No, at a word, madam. Indeed, I must not. I wish you much mirth. Well, then, farewell. <laughs> Yonder comes news. A wager they have met. My horse to yours, no. It is done. Agreed. Say, has our general met the enemy? They lie in view, but have not spoke as yet. So, the good horse is mine. I'll buy him of you. No, I'll nor sell nor give him. Lend you him, I will, for half a hundred years. Summon the town. How far off lie these armies? Within this mile and half. Then shall we hear their larum and they ours. Now. Mars, I prithee make us quick in work, that we with smoking swords may march from hence to help our fielded friends. Come, blow thy blast. Tullus Ophidius, is he within your walls? No, nor a man that fears you less than he. That's lesser than a little. Hark! Our drums are bringing forth our youth. We'll break our...
our walls rather than they shall pound us up. Our gates, which yet seem shut, we have but pinned with rushes. They'll open of themselves. Hark you! Far off! There is Orphidius! List what work he makes amongst your cloven army! Oh, they are at it! Their noise be our instruction! Ladders, ho! They fear us not, but issue forth their city. Now put your shields before your hearts and fight with hearts more proof than shields. Advance, brave Titus. They do disdain us much beyond our thoughts, which makes me sweat with wrath. Come on, my fellows. He that retires, I'll take him for a Volsi, and he shall feel mine edge. Contagion of the South light on you, you shames of Rome, you herd of boils and plagues, plaster you are, that you may be abhorred farther than seen, and one infect another against the wind a mile. You souls of geese that bear the shapes of men, how have you run from slaves that apes would beat? Pluto and hell, all hurt behind, backs red and faces pale with flight and agued fear. Men that charge home, or by the fires of heaven, I'll leave the foe and make my war on you. Look to it. Come on. If you stand fast, we'll beat them to their wives as they us to our trenches. Follow me. So now the gates are open. Now prove good seconds. Tis for the followers fortune widens them, not for the flyers. Mark me and do the like. Foolhardiness. Not I. Nor I. See, they've shut him in. To the pot, I warrant him. What has become of Marcus? Slain, sir, doubtless, following the flyers at the very heels. With them he enters, who upon the sudden clap to their gates. He is himself alone to answer all the city. Oh, noble fellow, who sensibly outdares his senseless sword, and when it bows, stands up. Thou art left, Marcus. A carbuncle entire as big as thou art were not so rich a jewel. Thou wast a soldier, even to Cato's wish. Not fierce and terrible only in strokes, but with thy grim looks and the thunder-like percussion of thy sounds, thou mightst thine enemies shake as if the world were feverless and it tremble. Look, sir. Marcius, let's stretch him off. We'll make remain alike. This one I carry to Rome, and I this. The Maranot. I took this silver. See here these movers that do prize their hours at a cracked drachma, cushions, leaden spoons, irons of a doit, doublets that hangmen would bury with those that wore them. These base slaves, ere yet the fight be done, pack up, down with them. But hark what noise the general makes to him. There is the man of my soul's hate, Ophidius, piercing our Romans then. Valiant Titus, take convenient numbers to make good the city, whilst I, with those that have the spirit, will haste to help Cominius. Worthy, sir, thou bleedst. Thy exercise hath been too violent for the second course of fight. Sir, praise me not. My work hath yet not warmed me. Fare you well. The blood I drop is rather physical than dangerous to me. To Orphidius, thus I will appear and fight. Now the fair goddess fortune fall deep in love with thee, and her great charms misguide thy opposer's swords. Bold gentleman, prosperity be thy page. Thy friend no less than those she placeth highest. So, farewell. Thou worthiest, Marcius. Go! Sound thy trumpet in the marketplace. Call thither all the officers of the town, where they shall know our mind. Away! Breathe you, my friends, 
Well fought. We are come off like Romans, neither foolish in our stands nor cowardly in retire. Believe me, sirs, we shall be charged again. Whilst we have struck by interims and conveying gusts, we have heard the charges of our friends. The Roman gods lead their successes as we wish our own. That both our powers with smiling fronts encountering may give you thankful sacrifice. Thy news? The citizens of Coriolis have issued and given to Lartius and to Martius battle. I saw our party to their trenches driven, and then I came away. Though thou speakest truth, methinks thou speakst not well. How long is it since? Above an hour, my lord. It is not a mile briefly. We heard their drums. How couldst thou in a mile confound an hour and bring thy news so late? But spies of the Vorses held me in chase, that I was forced to wheel three or four miles about. Else had I, sir, half an hour since brought my report. Who's yonder that does appear as ye were flayed? O oh, gods, he has the stamp of Martius, and I have before time seen him thus. Am I too late? The shepherd knows not thunder from a tabor more than I know the sound of Martius tongue from every meaner man. Am I too late? Aye, if you come not in the blood of others, but mantled in your own. Oh, let me clip ye in arms as sound as when I wooed in heart, as merry as when our nuptial day was done and tapers burnt to bed with. Flower of warriors. How is't with Titus Lashus? As with a man busied about decrees, condemning some to death and some to exile, ransoming him or pitying, threatening the other, holding Coriolis in the name of Rome, even like a fawning greyhound in a leash to let him slip at will. Where is that slave which told me they had beat you to your trenches? Where is he? Call him hither. Let him alone. He did inform the truth, but for our gentlemen... The common file, a plague, tribute for them, the mouse ne'er shunned the cat as they did budge from rascals worse than they. But how prevailed you? Will the time serve to tell? I do not think. Where is the enemy? Are you lords of the field? If not, why cease you till you are so? Martius, we have at disadvantage fought and did retire to win our purpose. How lies their battle? Know you on which side they have placed their men of trust? As I guess, Martius, their bands in the are the antiates of their best trust. Or them, Ophidius, their very heart of hope. I do beseech you, by all the battles wherein we have fought, by the blood we have shed together, by the vows we have made to endure friends, that you directly set me against Ophidius and his antiates, and that you not delay the present, but filling the air with swords advanced and darts, we prove this very hour. Though I could wish you were conducted to a gentle bath and balms applied to you, yet dare I never deny your asking. Take your choice of those that best can aid your action. Those are they that most are willing. If any such be here, no. as it were sin to doubt, that love this painting wherein you see me smeared, no. if any fear lesser his person than an ill report, no. if any think brave death outweighs bad life, no. and that his country's dearer than himself, let him alone, or so many so minded, wave thus to express his disposition and follow Marshall! Outward, which of you but is four Volsies? None of you but is able to bear against the great Orphidius a shield as hard as his. A certain number, though thanks to all, must I select. The rest shall bear the business in some other fight as cause will be obeyed. Please you to march, and four shall quickly draw out my command, which men are best inclined. March on, my fellows. Make good this ostentation, and you shall divide in all with us. So, let the ports be guarded. Keep your duties as I have set them down. If I do send, dispatch those centuries to our aid. The rest will serve for a short holding. If we lose the field, we cannot keep the town. Fear not our care, sir. Hence, and shut your gates upon us. Our guide, I come to the Roman camp conductors.
I'll fight with none but thee, for I do hate thee worse than a promise breaker. We hate alike. Not Afric owns a serpent. I abhor more than thy fame and envy. Fix thy foot. Let the first budger die the other slave, and the gods doom him after. If I fly, Marcius, hollow me like a hare. Within these three hours, Talus, alone I fought in your Coriolis walls and made what work I pleased. It is not my blood wherein thou seest me masked. For thy revenge, wrench up thy power to the highest. Wert thou the Hector that was the whip of your bragged progeny? Thou shouldst not escape me here! <laughs> 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 Vicious and not valiant Volshees, you have shamed me in your condemned seconds. which you profane never sound more. When drums and trumpets shall in the field prove flatterers, let courts and cities be made all of false-faced soothing. When steel grows soft as the parasite's silk, let him be made a coverture for the wars. No more, I say! For that I have not washed my nose that bled... Or foil some debile wretch, which without note here's many else have done, you shout me forth in acclamations hyperbolical, as if I loved my little should be dieted in praises sourced with lies. Too modest are you, more cruel to your good report than grateful to us that give you truly. By your patience, if against yourself you be incensed, we'll put you like one that means his proper harm in manacles. Then reason safely with you. Therefore, be it known as to us, to all the world, that Caius Martius wears this war's garland. In token of the which, my noble steed, known to the camp, I give him with all his trim belonging. And from this time... For what he did before Coriolis, call him, with all the applause and clamor of the host, Caius Martius Coriolanus. Bear the addition nobly ever. Caius Martius Coriolanus! Caius Martius Coriolanus! I will go wash. And when my face is fair, you shall perceive whether I blush or no. Howbeit, I thank you. I mean to stride your steed, and at all times to undercrest your good addition to the fairness of my power. So to our tent, where, ere we do repose us, we will write to Rome of our success. You, Titus Lartius, must to Coralli's back. Send us to Rome the best with whom we may articulate for their own good and ours. I shall, my lord. The gods begin to mock me. I, that now refused most princely gifts, am bound to beg of my lord general. Take, tis yours. What is't? I sometime lay here in Coriolis at a poor man's house. He used me kindly. He cried to me. I saw him prisoner. But then Orphidius was within my view, and wrath overwhelmed my pity. I request you to give my poor host... Freedom. Oh, well begged. Were he the butcher of my son, he should be free as is the wind. Deliver him, Titus. Marcius, his name? 
by Jupiter. For God, I am weary. Yea, my memory is tired. Have we no wine here? Go we to our tent. The blood upon your visage dries. Tis time it should be looked to. Come. The town is tame. T'will be delivered back on good condition. Condition? I would I were a Roman, for I cannot be in a Volsi be that I am. Condition? What good condition can a treaty find in a part that is at mercy? Five times, Martius, I have fought with thee. So often hast thou beat me, and wouldst do so, I think, should we encounter as often as we eat. By the elements, if e'er again I meet him, beard to beard, he's mine, or I am his. Mine emulation hath not that honour in it had, for where I thought to crush him in an equal force, true sword to sword, I'll potch at him some way, or wrath or craft may get him. He's the devil. Bolder, though not so subtle. My valour's poisoned, with only suffering stained by him, for him shall fly out of itself. No sleep, no sanctuary, being naked sick, nor fame, nor capital, the prayers of priests, no times of sacrifice, embargements all of fury, shall lift up their rotten privilege and custom gets my hate to marshes. Where I find him, were it at home, upon my brother's guard, even there, against the hospitable cannon, would I wash my fierce hand in his heart. Go you to the city. Learn how tis held, and what they are that must be hostages for Rome. Will not you go? I am attended at the Cypress Grove. I pray you, to south of City Mills, bring me word thither how the world goes, that to the pace of it I may spur on my journey. I shall, sir. The augurer tells me we shall have news tonight, good or bad. Not according to the prayer of the people, for they love not Martius. Nature teaches beasts to know their friends. <coughs> Pray you, who does the wolf love? The lamb. Aye, <laughs> to devour him, as the hungry plebeians would the noble Martius. He is a lamb indeed that bars like a bear. He's a bear indeed that lives like a lamb. You two are old men. Tell me one thing that I shall ask well, you. Well, sir? In what enormity is Martius poor in that you two have not in abundance? He is poor in no one fault, but stored with all. Especially in pride. And topping all others in boasting. This is strange now. Do you, too, know how you are censured here in the city? I mean, of us of the right-hand file, do you? Why, how, how are we censured? censured? Because you talk of pride now. <laughs> Will you not be angry? Well, 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 sir, well. Why, it's no great matter. For a very little thief of occasion will rob you of a great deal of patience, give your dispositions the reins, and be angry at your pleasures, at the least if you take it as a pleasure to you in being so. You uh, blame Martius for being proud. We do it not alone, sir. I know, you can do very little alone. For your helps are many, or else your actions would grow wondrous single. Your abilities are too infant-like for doing much alone. You talk of pride. Oh, that you could turn your eyes toward the napes of your necks and make but an interior survey of your good selves. Oh, that you could. What then, sir? Why, then you should discover a brace of the unmeriting... Proud, violent, testy magistrates, alias fools, as any in Rome. Meninius, you are known well enough, too. I am known to be a humorous patrician, and one that loves a cup of hot wine with not a drop of a laying Tiber in it. Said to be something imperfect in favouring the first complaint, hasty and tinder-like upon too trivial motion, one that converses more with the buttock of the night than with the forehead of the morning. <laughs> what I think I utter and spend my malice in my breath. 
Meeting two such wheelsmen as you are, I cannot call you Lysurgises. If the drink you give me touch my palate adversely, I make a crooked face at it. I cannot say your worships have delivered the matter well when I find the <coughs> ass in compound with the major part of your syllables, and though I must be content to bear with those that say you are reverend grave men, yet they lie deadly that tell you you have good faces. If you see this in the map of my microcosm, follows it that I am known well enough to? What harm can your bison conspectuities glean out of this character if I be known well enough to? Come, sir, come. We know you well enough. You know neither me, yourselves, nor anything. You are ambitious for poor knaves, caps, and legs. You wear out a good wholesome forenoon in hearing a cause between a, an orange wife and a faucet seller, and then return the controversy of threepence to a second day of audience. When you are hearing a matter between party and party, if you chance to be pinched with a colic, you make faces like mummers, set up the bloody flag against all patients, and in roaring for a chamber pot, dismiss the controversy bleeding, the more entangled by your hearing. All the peace you make in their cause is calling both the parties knaves. You are a pair of strange ones. Come, come. You are well understood to be a perfect jibber for the table than a necessary bencher in the capital. Our very priests must become mockers if they shall encounter such ridiculous subjects as you are. When you speak best unto the purpose, it is not worth the wagging of your beards, and your beards deserve not so honourable a grave as to stuff a botcher's cushion or to be entombed in an ass's pack saddle. Yet you must be saying Martius is proud, who, in a cheap estimation, is worth all your predecessors since Deucalion, though peradventure some of the best of them were hereditary hangmen. Good ain't your worships. More of your conversation would infect my brain, being the herdsman of the beastly plebeians. I will be bold to take my leave of you. Come on, come on, Mr. How now, my as fair as noble ladies, and the moon, was she earthly no nobler? <laughs> Whither do you follow your eyes so fast? Honourable Menenius, my boy Martius approaches. For the love of Juno, let's go! Martius coming home? I worthy Menenius, and with most prosperous approbation. Take my cap, Jupiter, and I thank thee. Oh! Martius coming home. Nay, yeah, it is true. It is true. Look, here's a letter from him. The state hath another, his wife another, and I think there's one at home for you. I will make my very house real tonight. A letter for me? Yes, certain there's a letter for you. I saw it. A letter for me? It gives me an estate of seven years' health, in which time I will make a lip with the physician. <laughs> The most sovereign prescription in Galen is but empiricutic, and to this preservative of no better report than a horse drench. Is he not wounded? He was wont to come home wounded. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he is wounded. I thank the gods for it. So do I, too, if it be not too much. Brings a victory in his pocket. The wounds become him. On his brows. Menenius, he comes a third time home with the oaken garland. <sighs> Has she disciplined Ophidius soundly? I just Lartius writes they fought together, but Ophidius got off. And twas time for him too, I'll warrant him that. And he had stayed by him, I would not have been so Phidias. <coughs> <laughs> for all the chests in Coriolis and the gold that's in them. Is the Senate possessed of this? Good ladies, let's go. Yes, yes, yes. The Senate has letters from the general wherein he gives my son the whole name of the war. He has in this action outdone his former deeds doubly. In troth, there's wondrous things spoke of him. Wondrous, aye, I warrant you, and not without his true purchasing. The gods grant them true. True? How war? True? I'll be sworn they are true. Where is he wounded? God save your good worships. Martius is coming home. He has more cause to be proud. Where is he wounded? Either shoulder and either left arm. 
There will be large cicatrices to show the people when he shall stand for his place. He received in the repulse of Tarquin seven hurts in the body. Uh, one in the neck, two in the thigh. There's nine that I know. He had before this last exposition twenty-five wounds upon him. No, it's twenty-seven. Every gash was an enemy's grave. Hark, the trumpets. These are the ushers of Martius. Before him he carries noise, and behind him he leaves tears. Death, that dark spirit in his nervy arm doth lie, which being advanced declines, and then men die. No Rome, that all alone Martius did fight within Coriolis gates, where he hath won, with fame, a name to Caius Martius. These in honor follows Coriolanus. Welcome to Rome, renowned Coriolanus. No more of this. It does offend my heart. Pray now, no more. <laughs> Look, sir, your mother. Oh, you have, I know, petitioned all the gods for my prosperity. Nay, my good soldier, up, my gentle Martius. Worthy Caius, and by deed achieving honor newly named. What is it? Coriolanus must I call thee? But oh, thy wife. My gracious silence. Hail. Wouldst thou have laughed had I come coffined home that weeps to see me triumph? Oh, my dear, such eyes the widows in Coriolis wear, and mothers that lack sons. Oh, the gods crown thee! And live you yet! <laughs> <laughs> oh, my sweet lady, pardon. I know not where to turn. Oh, welcome home, and welcome, general, and you're welcome all! A hundred thousand welcomes. <laughs> I, I, I could weep and I could laugh. I am light and heavy. Welcome. A curse begin at very Rutong's heart that is not glad to see thee. You are three that Rome should dote on. Yet by the faith of men, we have some old crab trees here at home that will not be grafted to your relish. <laughs> yet welcome, warriors. <laughs> We call a nettle but a nettle, and the faults of fools but folly. Ever right. Menenius, ever, ever. Give way there and go on. Your hand and yours. Ere in our own house I do shade my head, the good patricians must be visited, from whom I have received not only greetings, but with them change of honours. I have lived to see inherited my very wishes and the buildings of my fancy. Only there's one thing wanting which I doubt not, but our Rome will cast upon thee. No, good mother, I had rather be their servant in my way than sway with them in theirs. On to the capital. <laughs> speak of him, and the bleared sides are spectacle to see him. Your prattling nurse into a rapture lets her baby cry while she chats him. The kitchen malkin pins her richest lock about her reachy neck, clambering the walls to eye him. Stalls, bulks, windows are smothered up, leads filled and ridges horsed with variable complexions, all agreeing in earnestness to see him. Seld shown flame and do press among the popular throngs and puff to win a vulgar station. How are veiled dames commit the war of white and damask in their nicely gaudy cheeks to the wanton spoil of Phoebus burning kisses? Such a bother! As if that whatsoever God who leads him were slyly crept into his human powers and gave him graceful posture. On the sudden, I warrant him counsel. Then our office may, during his power, go sleep. He cannot temperately transport his honours from where he should begin and end, but will lose those he hath won. In that there's comfort. 
doubt not. The commoners for whom we stand, but they upon their ancient malice will forget with the least cause these his new honours, which that he will give them make I as little question as he is proud to do't. I heard him swear, were he to stand for consul, never would he appear in the marketplace, nor on him put the napless vesture of humility, nor showing, as the manner is, his wounds to the people, beg their stinking breaths. Tis right. It was his word. Oh, he would miss it rather than carry it. But by the suit of the gentry to him and the desire of the nobles... I wish no better than have him hold that purpose... And to put it in execution. Tis most like he will. It shall be to him then as our good wills. A sure destruction. So it must fall out to him. Or our authorities for an end. We must suggest the people in what hatred he still hath held them. That to his power he would have made them mules, silenced their pleaders and dispropertied their freedoms, holding them in human action and capacity of no more soul nor fitness for the world than camels in their war, though of their provend only for bearing burthens and sore blows for sinking under them. This, as you say, suggested at some time when his soaring insolence shall touch the people. Which time shall not want if he be put upon, t and that's as easy as to set dogs on sheep. <laughs> Will be his fire to kindle their dry stubble, and their blaze shall darken him for ever. <clears throat> What's the matter? Uh, you are sent for to the capital. It is thought that Martius shall be consul. I have seen the dumb men throng to see him, and the blind to hear him speak. Matrons flung gloves, ladies and maids their scarves and handkerchiefs upon him as he passed. The nobles bended as to Jove's statue, and the commons made a shower and thunder with their caps and shouts. I never saw the like. Let's to the capital, and carry with us ears and eyes for the time, but hearts for the event. Have with you. Come, come, they are almost here. How many stand for consulships? Three, they say, but tis thought of everyone Coriolanus will carry. That's a brave fellow, but he's vengeance proud and loves not the common people. Faith, there have been many great men that have flattered the people who ne'er loved them, and there be many that they have loved they know not wherefore, so that if they love they know not why. They hate upon no better a ground. Therefore, for Coriolanus neither to care whether they love or hate him manifests the true knowledge he has in their disposition, and out of his noble carelessness lets them plainly see it. Well, if he did not care whether he had their love or no, he waved indifferently to doing them neither good nor harm. But he seeks their hate with greater devotion than they can render at him, and leaves nothing undone that may fully discover him their opposite. Now, to seem to affect the malice and displeasure of the people, is as bad as that which he dislikes, to flatter them for their love. He hath deserved worthily of his country, and his assent is not by such easy degrees as those who, having been supple and courteous to the people, bonneted without any further deed to have them at all into their estimation and report. But he hath so planted his honours in their eyes and his actions in their hearts, that for their tongues to be silent and not confess so much were a kind of ingrateful injury. To report otherwise were a malice that giving itself the lie would pluck rip proof and rebuke from every ear that heard it. No more of him. He's a worthy man. Make way, they're coming. Having determined of the Volsies and to send for Titus Lartius, it remains as the main point of this hour after meeting to gratify his noble service that hath thus stood for his country. 
Therefore, please you, most reverend and grave elders, to desire the present consul and last general in our well-found successes to report a little of that worthy work performed by Caius Martius Coriolanus, whom we met here both to thank and to remember with honors like himself. Speak, good Cominius. Leave nothing out for length, and make us think rather our state's defective for requital than we to stretch it out. Masters of the people, we do request your kindest ears, and after your loving motion toward the common body to yield what passes here. We are convented upon a pleasing treaty, and have hearts inclinable to honor and advance the theme of our assembly. Which the rather we shall be blessed to do if he remember a kinder value of the people than he hath here too prized them at. That's off, that's off. I would you rather have been silent. Please you to hear Cominius speak? Most willingly. But yet my caution was more pertinent than the rebuke you give it. He loves your people, but tie him not to be their bedfellow. Worthy Cominius, speak. Nay, keep your place. Sit, Coriolanus. Never shame to hear what you have nobly done. Your honor's pardon. I had rather have my wounds to heal again than hear say how I got them. So, I hope my words dispensed you not. No, sir. Yet oft, when blows have made me stay, I fled from words. You soothed not, therefore hurt not. But your people, I love them as they weigh... Pray not, sit down. I had rather have one scratch my head in the sun when the alarm was struck than idly sit to hear my nothings monstered. Oh. Masters of the people, your multiplying spawn, how can he flatter that thousand to one good one, when you now see he'd rather venture all his limbs for honor than one on's ears to hear it? Proceed, Cominius. I shall lack voice. The deeds of Coriolanus should not be uttered feebly. It is held that valor is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the haver. If it be, the man I speak of cannot in the world be singly counterpoised. At sixteen years, when Tarquin made a head for Rome, he fought beyond the mark of others. Our then dictator, whom with all praise I point at, saw him fight when with his Amazonian chin he drove the bristled lips before him. He bestrid an oppressed Roman, and in the consul's view slew three opposers. Tarquin's self he met and struck him on his knee. In that day's feats, when he might act the woman in the scene, he proved best man in the field, and for his meed was brow-bound with the oak. His pupil age, man entered thus. He waxed like a sea, and in the brunt of seventeen battles since, he lurched all swords of the garland. For this last, before and in Coriolis, let me say I cannot speak him home. He stopped the flyers, and by his rare example made the coward turn terror into sport. As weeds before a vessel under sail, so men obeyed and fell below his stem. His sword, death's stamp, where it did mark, it took. From face to foot, he was a thing of blood, whose every motion was timed with dying cries. Alone, he entered the mortal gate of the city, which he painted with shunless destiny. Aidless came off, and with a sudden reinforcement, struck Coriolis like a planet. Now, all's his, when by and by the din of war gan pierce his ready sense, then straight his doubled spirit requickened what in flesh was fatigued, and to the battle came he, where he did run reeking o'er the lives of men as if twere a perpetual spoil, until we called both field and city hours, he never stood to ease his breast with panting. Worthy man, he cannot but with measure fit the honors which we devise him. Our spoils he kicked at, and looked upon things precious as they were the common mark of the world. He covets less than misery itself would give, rewards his deeds with doing them, 
and is content to spend the time to end it. He's right, noble. Let him be called for. Call Coriolanus. He doth appear. The Senate, Coriolanus, are well pleased to make thee consul. I do owe them still my life and services. It then remains that you do speak to the people. I do beseech you. Let me or leap that custom, for I cannot put on the gown, stand naked, and entreat them for my wounds' sake to give their suffrage. Please you, that I may pass this doing. Sir, the people must have their voices. Neither will they bait one jot of ceremony. Put them not to it. Pray you, go fit you to the custom, and take to you as your predecessors have. Your honour with your form. It is a part that I shall blush in acting and might well be taken from the people. Mark you that? To brag unto them, thus I did and thus show them the unaching scars which I should hide as if I had received them for the hire of their breath only. Do not stand upon it. We recommend to you, tribunes of the people, our purpose to them and to our noble consul wish we all joy and honor. To Coriolanus come all joy and honor. To Coriolanus come all joy and honor. You see how he intends to use the people? May they perceive his intent. He will require them as if he did contemn what he requested should be in them to give. Come, we'll inform them of our proceedings here. On the marketplace, I know they do attend us. Once if he do require our voices, we ought not to deny him. Now we may, sir, if we will. We have power ourselves to do it, but it is a power that we have no power to do. For if he show us his wounds and tell us his needs, we are to put our tongues into those wounds and speak for them. So if he tell us his noble deeds, we must also tell him our noble acceptance of them. And gratitude is monstrous, and for the multitude to be ungrateful were to make a monster of the multitude, of the which, we being members, should bring ourselves to be monstrous members. <laughs> and to make us no better thought of, a little help will serve. For once we stood up about the corn, he himself stuck not to call us the many-headed multitude. Now we have been called so of many. Not that our heads are some brown, some black, some abram, some bald, but that our wits are so diversely coloured. And truly, I think if all our wits were to issue out of one skull, they would fly east, west, north, south, and their consent of one direct way should be at once to all points of the compass. Uh, think ye so? Which way do you judge my wit would fly? Nay, your wit would not so soon out as another man's will. It is strongly wedged up in a blockhead. <laughs> but if it were at liberty, it would sure southward. Uh, why that way? To lose itself in a fog. <laughs> Where being three parts melted away with rotten dews, the fourth would return for conscience sake to help to get thee a wife. <laughs> uh, you never your tricks. You may, you may. Are you all resolved to give your voices? Nay, that, nay. But that's no matter. The greater part carries it. I say if he would incline to the people, there was never a worthier man. Uh, here he comes. And in the gown of humility, mark his behaviour. We are not to stay all together, but to come by him where he stands, by ones, by twos and by threes. He's to make his requests by particulars, wherein every one of us has a single honour in giving him our own voices with our own tongues. Therefore, follow me, and I'll direct you how you shall go by him. Oh, sir, you are not right. Have you not known the worthiest men have done it? What must I say? I pray, sir, plague upon it. I cannot bring my tongue to such a pace. Look, sir, my wounds. I got them in my country's service when some certain of your brethren roared and ran from the noise of our own drums. Oh, me the gods. You must not speak of that. You must desire them to think upon you. Think upon me? Hang them. I would they would forget me like the virtues which our divines lose by them. You'll mar all. I'll leave you. Pray you, speak to them, I pray you, 
in wholesome manner. Bid them wash their faces and keep their teeth clean. Oh. So, here comes a brace. <clears throat> you know the cause, sir, of my standing here. Oh, we do, sir. Tell us what hath brought you to it. Mine own desert. Your own desert? Aye, not mine own desire. Oh, not your own desire. No, sir, it was never my desire yet to trouble the poor with begging. Well, you must think if we give you anything, we hope to gain by you. Well, then I pray your price of the consulship. The price is to ask it kindly. Uh, kindly, sir, I pray, let me have it. I have wounds to show you which shall be yours in private. Your good voice, sir... What say you? You shall have it, worthy sir. A match, sir. May as in all two worthy voices begged, I have your arms and you. Well, this is something odd. And twere to give again, but tis no matter. Right. Pray you now, if it may stand with the tune of your voices that I may be consul, I have here the customary gown. You have deserved nobly of your country. And you have not deserved nobly. Your enigma? You have been a scourge to her enemies. You have been a rod to her friends. You have not indeed loved the common people. Oh, you should account me the more virtuous that I have not been common in my love. I will, sir, flatter my sworn brother, the people, to earn a dearer estimation of them. Tis a condition they account gentle. And since the wisdom of their choice is rather to have my hat than my heart, I will practice the insinuating nod and be off to them most counterfeitly. That is, sir, uh, I will counterfeit the bewitchment of some popular man and give it bountiful to the desirers. Therefore, beseech you, I may be consul. We hope to find you our friend and therefore give you our voices heartily. You have received many wounds for your country. I will not seal your knowledge with showing them. I will make much of your voices, and so trouble you no farther. The gods give you joy, they sir. Give you joy, sir, heartily. Most sweet voices. Better it is to die, better to starve, than crave the higher which first we do deserve. Why in this wolvish toque should I stand here to beg of Hob and Dick that does appear their needless vouches? Custom calls me to it. What custom wills, in all things should we do it. The dust on antique time would lie unswept, and mountainous error be too highly heaped for truth to appear. Rather than fool it so, let the high office and the honour go to one that would do thus. I am half through. The one part suffered, the other will I do. Here come no voices. Your voices! For your voices I have fought, watched for your voices... For your voices bear of wounds, two dozen odd battles, thrice six I have seen and heard of. For your voices have done many things, some less, some more. Your voices, indeed, I would be consul. He has done nobly and cannot go without any honest man's voice. Aye. Therefore let him be consul. The gods give him joy and make him good friend to the people. Amen. Amen. God Amen. Save Noble consul. God save you not. You have stood your limitation, and the tribunes endue you with the people's voice. Remains that in the official marks invested, you anon do meet the Senate. Is this done? The custom of request you have discharged. The people do admit you and are summoned to meet anon upon your approbation. Where? At the Senate House? There, Coriolan. May I change these garments? You may, sir. That I'll straight do, and knowing myself again, repair to the Senate House. I'll keep you company. Will you along? We stay here for the people. Fare you well. He has it now, and by his looks methinks tis warm at heart. With a proud heart he wore his humble weeds. Will you dismiss the people? Yeah. How now, my masters? Have you chose this man? He has our voices, sir. We pray the gods he may deserve your love. Amen, sir. 
To my poor and worthy notice, he mocked us when he begged our voices. Yeah. Certainly he floated us downright. No, he did his kind of speech. He did not mock us. No, not one amongst us, save yourself, but says he used us scornfully. He should have showed us his marks of merit, wounds received for his country. Oh, Why, so he did, I'm sure. No, 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 no. no man saw him. No. He said he had wounds which he could show in private, uh, and with his hat, thus waving it in scorn, I would be consul, yeah. says he. <laughs> Aged custom, but by your voices will not so permit me. Your voices, therefore. When we granted that, here was... I thank you for your voices. Thank you, your most sweet voices. Yeah. And now you have left your voices, I have no further with you. Yeah. Was not this mockery? Yeah. Why, either were you ignorant to see it, or seeing it, of such childish friendliness to yield your voices? Could you not have told him as you were lessened? When he had no power but was a petty servant to the state, he was your enemy. Ever speak against your liberties and the charters that you bear in the body of the wheel. And now, arriving a place of potency and sway of the state, if he should still malignantly remain fast foe to the plebeii, your voices might be curses to yourselves. You should have said that as his worthy deeds did claim no less than what he stood for, so his gracious nature would think upon you for your vices and translate his malice towards you into love, standing your friendly lord. Thus to have said, as you were foreadvised, had touched his spirit and tried his inclination. From him plucked either his gracious promise, which you might, as cause had called you up, have held him to, or else it would have galled his surly nature, which easily endures not article tying him to aught. So putting him to rage, you should have taken the advantage of his collar and passed him unelected. Did you perceive he did solicit you in free contempt when he did need your loves? And do you think that his contempt shall not be bruising to you when he hath power to crush? Why had your bodies no heart among you? Or had you tongues to cry against the rectorship of judgment? Have you ere now denied the asker? And now again, of him that did not ask, but mock, bestow your sued for tongues? He's not confirmed. We may deny him yet. And we'll deny him. I'll have 500 voices of that sound. Twice 500. And their friends to peace them. Take you hence instantly and tell those friends they have chosen a consul that will from them take their liberties. Make them of no more voice than dogs that are as often beat for barking as therefore kept to do so. Let them assemble and on a safer judgment all revoke your ignorant election. Enforce his pride and his old hate unto you. Besides, forget not with what contempt he wore the humble weed, how in his suit he scorned you. But your loves, thinking upon his services, took from you the apprehension of his present portents, which, most jibingly and gravely, he did fashion after the inveterate hate he bears you. Lay a fault on us, your tribunes, that we laboured no impediment between, but that you must cast your election on him. Say you chose him more after our commandment than as guided by your own true affections, and that your minds preoccupied with what you rather must do than what you should, made you against the grain to voice him, consul. Lay the fault on us. I spare us not. Say we read lectures to you. How youngly he began to serve his country, how long continued, and what stock he springs off. The noble house of the Martians from whence came that Ancus Martius, Numa's daughter's son, who after great Hostilius here was king. Of the same house Publius and Quintus were that our best water brought by Candid's hither. 
and censorinus. Nobly name it so, twice being by the people chosen censor, was his great ancestor. One thus descended that hath beside well in his person wrought to be set high in place, we did commend to your remembrances. But you have found, scaling his present bearing with his past, that he's your fixed enemy and revoke your sudden approbation. Say, you ne'er had dumped, harp on that still, but by our putting on. And presently, when you have drawn your number, repair to the capital! Let them go on. This mutiny were better put in hazard than stay past doubt for greater. If, as his nature is, he fall in rage with their refusal, both observe and answer the vantage of his anger. To the capital, come. We will be there before the stream of the people, and this shall seem as partly tis their own, <laughs> which we have goaded onward. Orphidius then had made new head. He had, my lord, and that it was which caused our swifter composition. So then the Volsies stand but as at first, ready when time shall prompt them to make road upon us again. They are warned, Lord Consul, so that we shall hardly in our ages see their banners wave again. Saw you Orphidius. On safeguard he came to me, and did curse against the Volsies, for they had so vilely yielded the town. He is retired to Antium. Spoke he of me? He did, my lord. How what? How often he had met you, sword to sword. That of all things upon the earth he hated your person most. That he would pawn his fortunes to hopeless restitution. So he might be called your vanquisher. At Antium lives he. At Antium. I wish I had a cause to seek him there to oppose his hatred fully. Welcome home. Behold... These are the tribunes of the people, the tongues of the common mouth. I do despise them, for they do prank them in authority against all noble sufferance. Pass no further. Now, ah, what is that? It will be dangerous to go on no further. What makes this change? The matter. Hath he not passed the noble and the common? Cominius, no. Have I had children's voices? Tribunes give way. He shall to the marketplace. The people are incensed against him. Stop, or all will fall in broil. Are these your herd? Must these have voices that can yield them now and straight disclaim their tongues? What are your offices? You being their mouths, why rule you not their teeth? Have you not set them on? Be calm, be calm. It is a purposed thing and grows by plot to curb the will of the nobility. Suffer it and live with such as cannot rule nor ever will be ruled. Caught not a plot! The people cry, you mocked them. And of late, when corn was given them gratis, you repined. Scandaled the suppliants for the people, called them time-pleasers, flatterers, foes to nobleness. What? This was known before. Not to them all. Have you informed them, Sithence? How? I informed them. You are like to do such business. Not unlike. Each way to better yours. Why then should I be consul? By yon clouds, let me deserve so ill as you and make me your fellow tribune. You show too much of that for which the people stir. If you will pass to where you are bound, you must inquire your way, which you are out of, with a gentler spirit. Or never be so noble as a consul, nor yoke with him for tribune. Let's be calm. People are abused, set on. This paltering becomes not Rome, nor has Coriolanus deserved this so dishonored rub, laid falsely in the plain way of his merit. Tell me of Torn. This was my speech, and I will speak it again. Not now, not now. Not in this heat, sir, now. Now, as I live, I will, my nobler friends. I crave their pardons for the mutable, rank-scented meanie. Let them regard me as I do not flatter, and therein behold themselves. I say again, in soothing them, we nourish against our senate the cockle of rebellion, insolence, sedition, which we ourselves have ploughed for, sowed, and scattered by mingling them with us, the honoured number, who lack not virtue, no, nor power, but that which they have given to beggars. Well, no more. 
No more words, we beseech you. Oh, no more. As for my country, I have shed my blood, not fearing outward force. So shall my lungs coy in words till their decay against those measles which we disdain should tetter us, yet sought the very way to catch them. You speak of the people as if you were a god to punish, not a man of their infirmity. Twere well we let the people know. What? What? His collar? Collar? Were I as patient as a midnight sleep, by Jove, t'would be my mind. It is a mind that shall remain a poison where it is, not poison any further. Shall remain. Hear you this triton of the minnows. Mark you his absolute shall. T'was from the cannon. Shall. Oh, good but most unwise patricians, why, you grave but reckless senators, have you thus given Hydra here to choose an officer that with his peremptory shall, being but the horn and noise of the monsters, wants not spirit to say he'll turn your current in a ditch and make your channel his? If he have power, then veil your ignorance. If none, awake your dangerous lenity. If you are learned, be not as common fools. If you are not, let them have cushions by you. You are plebeians if they be senators, and they are no less when both your voices blended, the great taste most palates theirs. They choose their magistrate, and such a one as he who puts his shall, his popular shall, against a graver bench than ever frowned in Greece. By Jove himself it makes the consul's base. And my soul aches to know when two authorities are up, neither supreme, how soon confusion may enter twixt the gap of both and take the one by the other. Well, on to the marketplace. Whoever gave that counsel to give forth the corn of the storehouse gratis as t'was used sometime in Greece. Well, well, no more of that. Though there the people had more absolute power, I say they nourished disobedience fed the ruin of the state. Why shall the people give one that speaks thus their voice? I'll give my reasons more worthier than their voices. They know the corn was not our recompense. Resting well assured, they ne'er did service for it. Being pressed to the war, even when the navel of the state was touched, they would not thread the gates. This kind of service did not deserve corn gratis. Being in the war, their mutinies and revolts wherein they showed most valour spoke not for them. The accusation which they have often made against the Senate, all cause unborn, could never be the native of our so frank donation. Well, what then? How shall this bosom multiplied digest the Senate's courtesy? Let deeds express what's like to be their words. We did request it. We are the greater pole, and in true fear they gave us our demands. Thus we debase the nature of our seats and make the rabble call our cares fears, which will in time break ope the locks of the Senate and bring in the crows to peck the eagles. Enough. Enough with overmeasure. No, take more. What may be sworn by, both divine and human, seal what I end with all. This double worship, where one part does disdain with cause, the other insult without all reason, where gentry, title, wisdom, cannot conclude but by the yea and no of general ignorance, it must omit real necessities and give way the while to unstable slightness. Purpose so barred, it follows nothing is done to purpose. Therefore, beseech you, you that will be less fearful than discreet, that love the fundamental part of state more than you doubt the change on't, that prefer a noble life before a long and wish to jump a body with a dangerous physic that's sure of death without it, at once pluck out the multitudinous tongue. Let them not lick the sweet which is their poison. Your dishonor mangles true judgment and bereaves the state of that integrity which should become it. Not not having the power to do the good it would for the ill which doth control it. Has said enough. Has spoken like a traitor and shall answer as traitors do. Thou wretch, despite all well thee. 
What should the people do with these bold tribunes on whom, depending, their obedience fails to the greater bench? In a rebellion, when what's not meet but what must be was law, then were they chosen. In a better hour, let what is meet be said it must be meet and throw their power in the dust! Manifest treason! This a consul? No! The Edile's Hall! Let him be apprehended. Go call the people, in whose name myself attach thee as a traitorous innovator, a foe to the public weal. Obey, I charge thee, and follow to thine answer. Hence, old goat. We'll shorty him. Aged, sir. Hands off. Hence, rotten thing, or I shall shake thy bones out of thy garments. Help ye, citizens! <laughs> Speak, good Sicinius. Hear me, people. Peace. You are at point to lose your liberty. Marcius would have all from you. Marcius, whom late you have named for consul. Fine, fine, fine. This is the way to kindle, not to quench. To unbuild the city and to lay all flat. What is the city but the people? By the consent of all, we were established the people's magistrates. You saw And so are like to do. That is the way to lay the city flat to bring the roof to the foundation and bury all which yet distinctly ranges in heaps and piles of ruin. This deserves death! All let us stand to our authority, all let us lose it. We do here pronounce upon the part of the people in whose power we were elected theirs, Marcius is worthy of present death! Bear him to the rock Tarpeian, and from thence into destruction cast him! He does seize him! Ah, Hear me one word! Beseech you, tribunes, hear me but a word! Be that you seem truly your country's friend, and temperately proceed to what you would thus violently redress. Sir... Those cold ways that seem like prudent helps are very poisonous where the disease is violent. Lay hands upon him and bear him to the rock. No, I'll die here. There's some among you who have beheld me fighting. Come, try upon yourselves what you have seen me. Come with that sword, tribunes, withdraw one. Lay hands upon him. Help! You that be noble, help him, young and old. Go, get you to your house. Be gone. Away. All will be naught else. Get you gone. Stand fast. We have as many friends as enemies. Shall it be put to that? The gods forbid. I prithee, noble friend, home to thy house. Leave us to cure this cause. What is a sore upon us? You cannot tent yourself. Be gone. Beseech you. Come, sir, along with us. I would they were barbarians as they are, though in Rome littered, not Romans as they are not, though carved in the porch of the Capitol. Be gone. Put not your worthy rage into your tongue. One time will owe another. On fair ground. I could beat forty of them. I could myself take up a brace of the best of them. Yea, the two tribunes. But now tis odds beyond arithmetic, and manhood is called foolery when it stands against a falling fabric. Will you hence before the tag return, whose rage doth rend like interrupted waters, and o'erbear what they are used to bear? Will you be gone! I'll try whether my old wit be in request with those that have but little. This must be patched with cloth of any color. Nay, come away. This man has marred his fortune. His nature is too noble for the world. 
He would not flatter Neptune for his trident or Jove for his power to thunder. His heart, his mouth, what his breast forges, at his tongue must vent, and, being angry, does forget that ever he heard the name of death. Here's goodly work. I would they were abed. I would they were in Tiber. What a vengeance. Could he not speak them fair? Yeah. Where is this viper? That would depopulate the city and be every man himself. You worthy tribute. He shall be thrown down the Tarpeian rock with rigorous hands. Aye. He hath resisted law, and therefore law shall scorn him further trial than the severity of the public power which he so sets at naught. He shall well know the noble tribunes of the people's mouths and we their hands. Sir, sir! Peace! Do not cry havoc where you should but hunt with modest warrant. Sir, how comes that you have hope to make this rescue? Hear me speak. As I do know the consul's worthiness, so can I name his fault. Consul? What consul? The consul Coriolanus. The consul! By the tribune's leave and yours, good people, I may be heard, I would crave a word or two, the which shall turn you to no further harm than so much loss of time. Speak briefly, then, for we are peremptory to dispatch this viperous traitor. Yeah. To eject him hence were but our danger, and to keep him here our certain death. Therefore it is decreed he dies tonight. Yeah. The good gods forbid that our renowned Rome, whose gratitude towards her deserved children is enrolled in Jove's own book, like an unnatural dam, should now eat up her own. He's a disease that must be cut away. Oh, he's a limb that has but a disease, mortal to cut it off, to cure it easy. What has he done to Rome that's worthy death? Killing our enemies. The blood he hath lost, which I dare vouch is more than that he hath by many an ounce. He dropped it for his country. And what is left to lose it by his country were to us all that do it and suffer it a brand to the end of the world. This is clean cab. Merely awry. When he did love his country, it honored him. The service of the foot being once gangrened is not then respected for what before it was. We'll hear no more. Pursue him to his house and pluck him thence, lest his infection being of catching nature spread further. <laughs> One word more. One word. This tiger-footed rage, when it shall find the harm of unscanned swiftness, will too late tie leaden pounds to seals. Proceed by process, lest parties as he is beloved break out and sack great Rome with Romans. If it were so... What? Do you talk? Have we not had a taste of his obedience? Our yeah. aedile smote, yeah. ourselves resisted? Yeah. Yeah. Consider this. He has been bred of the wars since I could draw a sword, and is ill-schooled in bolted language. Meal and bran together he throws without distinction. Give me leave. I'll go to him and undertake to bring him where he shall answer by a lawful form in peace to his utmost peril. Noble tribunes, it is the humane way. The other course will prove too bloody and the end of it unknown to the beginning. Noble Melenius, be you then as the people's officer, masters, lay down your weapons. Uh -huh. Go not home. Meet on the marketplace. We'll attend you there, where, if you bring not Martius, we'll proceed in our first way. I'll bring him to you. Let me desire your company. He must come, or what is worst will follow. Pray you, let's to him. Let 
them pull all about mine ears. Present me death on the wheel or at wild horse's heels. Or pile ten hills on the Tarpeian rock that the precipitation might downstretch below the beam of sight. Yet will I still be thus to them. You do the nobler. I muse my mother does not approve me further, who was wont to call them woolen vassals, things created to buy and sell with groats, to show bare heads in congregations, to yawn, be still and wonder, when one but of my ordinance stood up to speak of peace or war. I talk of you. Why did you wish me milder? Would you have me false to my nature? Rather say I play the man I am. Oh, sir, sir, sir. I would have had you put your power well on before you had worn it out. Let's go. You might have been enough a man you are with striving less to be so. Lesser had been the taxings of your dispositions if you had not showed them how you were disposed ere they lacked power to cross you. Let them hang. Aye, and burn too. Come, come, you have been too rough. Something too rough. You must return and mend it. There's no remedy, unless by not so doing, our good city cleave in the midst and perish. Pray be counselled. I have a heart as little apt as yours, but yet a brain that leads my use of anger to better vantage. Well said, noble woman. Before he should thus stoop to the herd, but that the violent fit of the time craves it as physic for the whole state... I would put mine armor on, which I can scarcely bear. What must I do? Return to the tribute. Well, what then? What then? Repent what you have spoke. For them? I cannot do it to the gods. Must I then do to them? You are too absolute. Though therein you can never be too noble, but when extremities speak. I have heard you say, honor and policy, like unsevered friends in the war, do grow together. Ground that and tell me... In peace what each of them by the other lose, that they can buy not there. Tush, tush, a good demand. If it be honour in your wars to seem the same you are not, which for your best end you adopt your policy, how is it less or worse that it shall hold companionship in peace with honour as in war, since that to both it stands in like request? Why force you this? Because that now it lies you on to speak to the people not by your own instruction, nor by the matter which your heart prompts you, but with such words that are but roted in your tongue, though but bastards and syllables of no allowance to your bosom's truth. Now this no more dishonours you at all than to take in a town with gentle words, which else would put you to your fortune and the hazard of much blood. I would dissemble with my nature where my fortunes and my friends at stake required I should do so in honour. I am in this your wife, your son, these senators, the nobles... And you will rather show our general louch how you can frown and spend a fawn upon them for the inheritance of their loves and safeguard of what that want might ruin. Noble lady, come, go with us, speak fair. You may salve so not what is dangerous present, but the loss of what is past. I pray thee now, my son, go to them with this bonnet in thy hand, and thus far, having stretched it, here be with them. Thy knee bussing the stones. For in such business action is eloquence, and the eyes of the ignorant more learned than the ears, waving thy head, which often thus correcting thy stout heart, now humble as the ripest mulberry that will not hold the handling. Or say to them, thou art their soldier, and being bred in broils, hast not the soft way which thou dost confess were fit for thee to use as they to claim in asking their good loves. But thou wilt frame thyself Forsooth, hereafter theirs, so far as thou hast power and person. This but done, even as she speaks, why, their hearts were yours, for they have pardons being asked, as free as words to little purpose. Prithee now, go and be ruled. Although I know thou hadst rather follow thine enemy in a fiery gulf than flatter him in a bower. Here is Cominius. I have been in the marketplace, and, sir, tis fit you make strong party, or defend yourself by calmness or by absence, all's in anger. Only fair speech. I think twill serve if he can thereto frame his spirit. He must and will. Prithee now, say you will and go about it. Must I go show them my unbarbed sconce? Must I, with my base tongue, give to my noble heart a lie that it must bear? Well... I will do it. Yet were there but this single plot to lose, this mould of marshes, they to dust should grind it and throw it against the wind. To the marketplace! 
You have put me now to such a part which never I shall discharge to the life. Come, come, we'll prompt you. I pray thee now, sweet son. As thou hast said, my praises made thee first a soldier. So to have my praise for this, perform a part thou hast not done before. Well, I must do it. Away my disposition, and possess me some harlot spirit. My throat of war be turned, which quired with my drum, into a pipe, small as an eunuch, or the virgin voice that babies lulls asleep. The smiles of knaves tent in my cheeks, and schoolboys' tears take up the glasses of my sight. A beggar's tongue make motion through my lips, and my armed knees, who bowed but in my stirrup, bend like his that hath received an arms. I will not do it, lest I shall cease to honour mine own truth, and by my body's action teach my mind a most inherent baseness. At thy choice, then, to beg of thee, it is my more dishonour than thou of them. Come all to ruin. Let thy mother rather feel thy pride than fear thy dangerous stoutness. Or I mock at death with as big heart as thou. Do as thou list. Thy valiantness was mine, now suckst it from me. But O oh, thy pride thyself. Pray be content. Mother, I am going to the marketplace. Chide me no more. I'll mount a bank their loves, cog their hearts from them, and come home beloved of all the trades in Rome. Look, I am going. Commend me to my wife. I'll return, consul, or never trust to what my tongue can do with a way of flattery further. Do your will. Away! The tribunes do attend you. Arm yourself to answer mildly, for they are prepared with accusations, as I hear, more strong than are upon you yet. The word is mildly, pray you, let us go. Let them accuse me by invention, I will answer in mine honour. Aye, but mildly. Well, mildly be it then. Mildly. <laughs> In this point, charge him home, that he affects tyrannical power. If he evade us there, enforce him with his envy to the people, and that the spoil got on the antiates was ne'er distributed. What will he come? He's coming. How accompanied? With old Menenius and those senators that always favoured him. Have you a catalogue of all the voices that we have procured set down by the pole? I have. It is ready. Have you collected them by tribes? I have. Assemble presently the people hither, and when they hear me say, It shall be so if the right and strength of the commons, be it either for death, for fine, or banishment, then let them, if I say fine, cry, fine, if death, cry, death, insisting on the old prerogative and power in the truth of the cause. I shall inform them. And when such time they have begun to cry, let them not cease but with a din confused, enforce the present execution of what we chance to sentence. Very well. Make them be strong and ready for this hint when we shall hap to gift them. Go about it. Put him to collar straight. He hath been used ever to conquer and to have his worth of contradiction. Being once chafed, he cannot be reined again to temperance. Then he speaks what's in his heart. And that is there which looks with us to break his neck. <laughs> well, here he comes. Calmly, I do beseech you. I, as an ostler that for the poorest peace will bear the knave by the volume. The honoured gods keep Rome in safety, and the chairs of justice supplied with worthy men. Plant love amongst, throng our large temples with the shows of peace, and not our streets with war. Amen, amen. A noble wish. Draw near, ye people. List your tribunes. Audience, peace, I say. First, hear me speak. Well, say, 
Shall I be charged no further than this present? Must all determine here. I do demand, if you submit you to the people's voices, allow their officers and are content to suffer lawful censure for such faults as shall be proved upon you. I am content. No, citizens, he says he is content. The warlike service he has done, consider. Think upon the wounds his body bears, which show like graves in the holy churchyard. <laughs> Scratches with briars, scars to move laughter only. Consider further that when he speaks not like a citizen, you find him like a soldier. Do not take his rougher accents for malicious sounds, but, as I say, such as become a soldier rather than envy you. Well, well, no more. What is the matter? That being passed for consul with full voice... I am so dishonored that the very hour you take it off again. Answer to us. Say, then. Tis true, I ought so. We charge you that you have contrived to take from Rome all seasoned office Aye. and to wind yourself into a power tyrannical Aye. for which you are a traitor to the people. How? Yeah. Traitor? Temperately. You promised. The fires of the lowest hell fold in the people. Aye. Call me their traitor, thou injurious tribune. Within thine eyes sat 20,000 deaths. In thy hands clutched as many millions. In thy lying tongue both numbers, I would say, Thou liest unto thee with a voice as free as I do pray the gods. Mark you this, people, to the rock with them. Peace. We need not put new matter to his charge. What you have seen him do and heard him speak, beating your officers, cursing yourselves, Aye. opposing laws with strokes, and here defying those whose great power must try him. Even this, so criminal and in such capital kind, deserves extremist death. Aye. But since he hath served well for Rome... What do you pray to service? I talk of that that knoweth. You? Oh. Is this the promise that you made your mother? No, I pray you. I'll know no further. Let them pronounce the steep Tarpeian death. Vagabond exile, flaying, pent to linger, but with a grain a day. I would not buy their mercy at the price of one fair word, nor check my courage for what they can give to have with saying good morrow. For that he has, as much as in him lies, from time to time, envied against the people, uh, seeking means to pluck away their power, uh, as now at last given hostile strokes, and that not in the presence of dreaded justice, but on the ministers that doth distribute it in the name of the people and in the power of us, the tribunes. We... Even from this instant, banish him, our city, oh. in peril of precipitation from off the rock Tarpeian, never more to enter our Rome gates. Oh. In the people's name, I say it shall be so. It shall be so. Common friend, he's sentenced. No more hearing. Let me speak. I have been consul and can show for Rome her enemies' marks upon me. I do love my country's good with a respect more tender, more holy, and profound than mine own life. My dear wife's estimate, her womb's increase, and treasure of my loins. Then, if I would speak that... We know your drift. Speak what? There's no more to be said. But he is banished as enemy to the people and his country. It shall be so. It shall be so. It shall be so. as reek of the rotten fens, whose loves I prize as the dead carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air. I banish you and here remain.
with your uncertainty. Let every feeble rumor shake your hearts. Your enemies, with nodding of their plumes, fan you into despair. Have the power still to banish your defenders, till at length your ignorance, which finds not till it feels, making but reservation of yourselves, still your own foes, deliver you as most abated captives to some nation that won you without blows, despising for you. The city, thus I turn my back. There is a world elsewhere. The people's enemy is gone. Is gone. <laughs> Come, leave your tears. A brief farewell. The beast with many heads butts me away. Nay, mother, where is your ancient courage? You were used to say extremities was the trier of spirits that common chances, common men could bear. That when the sea was calm, all boats alike showed mastership in floating. Fortune's blows, when most struck home, being gentle, wounded, craves a noble cunning. You were used to load me with precepts that would make invincible the hearts that conned them. Oh, heavens, oh, heavens. Nay, I prithee, woman. Now the red pestilence strike all trades in Rome and occupation. Perish. What, what, what? I shall be loved when I am lacked. Nay, mother, resume that spirit when you were wont to say if you had been the wife of Hercules, six of his labours you'd have done and saved your husband so much sweat. Cominius, droop not. Adieu. Farewell, my wife, my mother. I'll do well yet. Thou old and true Meninius, thy tears are salter than a younger man's and venomous to thine eyes. My sometime general, I have seen thee stern, and thou hast oft beheld heart-hardening spectacles. Tell thee, sad women, tis fond to wail inevitable strokes as tis to laugh at them. My mother, <laughs> you wot well, my hazard still have been your solace, and believe not likely, though I go alone, like to a lonely dragon that his fen makes feared and talked of more than seen. Your son will or exceed the common or be caught with cautelous baits and practice. My first son, whither wilt thou go? <laughs> Take good Cominius with thee a while. Determine on some course more than a wild expostulate to each chance that started away before thee. Oh, the gods. <laughs> I'll follow thee a month. Devise with thee where thou shalt rest, that thou mayst hear of us and we of thee. So if the time thrust forth a cause for thy repeal, we shall not send o'er the vast world to seek a single man and lose advantage, which doth ever cool in the absence of the needer. Fare ye well. Thou hast years upon thee, and thou art too full of the war's surfeits to go rove with one that's yet unbruised. Bring me but out at gate. Come, my sweet wife, <laughs> my dearest mother, and my friends of noble touch, when I am forth... Bid me farewell and smile. I pray you, come. While I remain above the ground, you shall hear from me still, and never of me aught but what is like me formerly. That's worthily as any ear can hear. Come, let's not weep. If I could shake off but one seven years from these old arms and legs, by the good gods, I'd with thee every foot. Give me thy hand. Come. Bid 
them all home. He's gone and we'll know further. The nobility are vexed, whom we see have sided in his behalf. Now we have shown our power. Let us seem humbler after it is done than when it was a doing. Bid them home. Say their great enemy is gone, and they stand in their ancient strength. <laughs> Dismiss them home, sir. Here comes his mother. Let's not meet her. Why? They say she's mad. They have taken note of us. Keep on your way. Oh, you are well met. The hoarded plague of the gods requite your love. Peace, peace, be not so loud. If that I could for weeping, you should hear. Nay, and you shall hear some. Will you be gone? You shall stay too. I would I had the power to say so to my husband. Are you mankind? I fool, is that a shame? Note but this fool. Was not a man my father? Hadst thou foxship to banish him that struck more blows for Rome than thou hast spoken words? Oh, blessed heaven! More noble blows than ever thou wise words, and for Rome's good? I'll tell thee what. Yet go! Nay! But thou shalt stay too. I would my son were in Arabia, and thy tribe before him his good sword in his hand. What then? What then? He'd make an end of thy posterity. Bastards and all! Good man, the wounds that he does bear for Rome! Come, come, peace! I would he had continued to his country as he began, and not unknit himself the noble knot he made. I would he had. I would he had. Twas you incense the rabble. Catch that can judge as fitly of his worth as I can of those mysteries which heaven will not have earth to know. Pray let us go. Now pray, sir, get you gone. You have done a brave deed. Here you go. Hear this. As far as doth the capital exceed the meanest house in Rome, so far, my son, this lady's husband here, this do you see, whom you have banished, does exceed you all. Well, well, we'll leave you. Why stay we to be baited with one that wants our wits? Take my prayers with you. I would the gods had nothing else to do but to confirm my curses. Could I meet him but once a day, it would unclog my heart of what lies heavy to it. You have told them home, and by my troth you have cause. You'll sup with me. Anger's my meat. I sup upon myself, and so shall starve with feeding. Come, let's go. Leave this faint puling, and lament as I do, in anger. Juno-like. Come, come, come. Fine. I think is Adrian. It is so, sir. Truly, I have forgot you. I am a Roman, and my services are, as you are, against them. Know you me yet? Nicano, no? The same, sir. <laughs> you had more beard when I last saw you, but your favourite is well appeared by your tongue. What's the news in Rome? I have a note from the Volscian state to find you out there. You have well saved me a day's journey. There have been in Rome strange insurrections. The people against the senators, patricians and nobles. Have been? Is it ended then? Our state thinks not so. They are in a most warlike preparation and hope to come upon them in the heat of their division. The main blaze of it is past, but a small thing would make it flame again. For the nobles receive so to heart the banishment of that worthy Coriolanus that they are in a ripe aptness to take all power from the people and to pluck from them their tribunes forever. This lies glowing, I can tell you, and is almost mature for the violent breaking out. Coriolanus banished? Banished, sir. Uh, you will be welcome with this intelligence, Nicanor. The day serves well for them now. I've heard it said, the fittest time to corrupt a man's wife is when she's fallen out with her husband. <laughs> Your noble Talus Orphidius will appear well in these wars, his great opposer Coriolanus being now in no request of his country. He cannot choose. I am most fortunate thus accidentally to encounter you. You'll vend him a business, and I will merrily accompany you home. 
I shall, between this and supper, tell you most strange things from Rome, all tending to the good of their adversaries. Have you an army ready, say you? A most royal one. The centurions and their charges distinctly billeted, already in the entertainment, and to be on foot at an hour's warning. I am joyful to hear of their readiness, and I am the man, I think, that shall set them in present action. So, sir... Heartily well met, and most glad of your company. You take my part from me, sir. I have the most cause to be glad of yours. <laughs> well, let us go together. Goodly city is this Antium. City, tis I that made thy widows. Many an heir of these fair edifices for my wars have I heard groan and drop. Then know me not, lest that thy wives with spits and boys with stones in puny battle slay me. Save you, sir. And you. Direct me, if it be your will, where great Ophidius lies. Is he in Antium? He is, and feasts the nobles of the state at his house this night. Which is his house, beseech you? This here before you. Thank you, sir. Farewell. O oh, world, thy slippery turns. Friends now fast sworn, whose double bosoms seems to wear one heart, whose hours, whose bed, whose meal and exercise are still together, who twin as twere in love unseparable, shall within this hour, on a dissension of a doit, break out to bitterest enmity. So fellest foes, whose passions and whose plots have broke their sleep to take the one the other by some chance, some trick not worth an egg, shall grow dear friends and interjoin their issues so with me my birthplace hate i and my loves upon this enemy town i'll enter if he slay me he does fair justice if he give me way i'll do his country service Feast smells well, but I appear not like a guest. Hey, what would you have, friend? When see you? Here's no place for you. Pray go to the door. Ah, I've deserved no better entertainment in being Coriolanus. Whence are you, sir? Has the porter his eyes in his head that he gives entrance to such companions? Pray get you out. Away. Away? Get you away. Now thou art troublesome. Are you so brave? I'll have you talked with anon. You know, what fellow's this? A strange one as ever I looked on. I cannot get him out of the house. Prithee, call my master to him. And what have you to do here, fellow? Uh, pray you, avoid the house. Let me but stand. I will not hurt your heart. Uh, what are you? A gentleman. Oh, Marvellous poor one. True, so I am. Uh, pray you, poor gentleman, take up some other station. Here's no place for you. Pray you, avoid. Come. Follow your function. Go and batten on toll bits. What? You will not? Prithee, tell my master what a strange guest he has here. And I shall. Where dwellest thou? Under the canopy. Under the canopy? Aye. Where's that? In the city of kites and crows. In the city of kites and crows. What an ass it is. Then thou dwellest with doors, too. No, I serve not thy master. No, sir. Do you meddle with my master? Aye, it is an honester service than to meddle with thy mistress. Thou prates and prates. Serve with thy trencher. Hats! Where is this fellow? Here, sir. I'd have beaten him like a dog, but for disturbing the lords within. Whence comest thou? What wouldst thou? Thy name? Why speaks not? Speak, man. What's thy name? If Talus. 
Not yet thou knowest me, and seeing me dost not think me for the man I am. Necessity commands me name myself. What is thy name? A name unmusical to the Volsian's ears and harsh in sound to thine. Say, what's thy name? Thou hast a grim appearance, and thy face bears a commandant. Though thy tackle's torn, thou show'st a noble vessel. What's thy name? Prepare thy brow to frown. Knowst thou me yet? I know thee not. Thy name? My name is Caius Martius, who hath done to thee particularly and to all the Volsies great hurt and mischief. Thereto witness may my surname, Coriolanus. The painful service, the extreme dangers, and the drops of blood shed for my thankless country are requited but with that surname, a good memory and witness of the malice and displeasure which thou shouldst bear me. Only that name remains. The cruelty and envy of the people permitted by our dastard nobles who have all forsook me hath devoured the rest and suffered me by the voice of slaves to be whooped out of Rome. Now this extremity hath brought me to thy hearth, not out of hope, mistake me not, to save my life. For if I had feared death of all the men in the world, I would have voided thee, but in mere spite to be full quit of those my banishers, stand I before thee here. Then if thou hast a heart of reek in thee that wilt revenge thine own particular wrongs and stop those maims of shame seen through thy country. Speed thee straight and make my misery serve thy turn. So use it that my revengeful services may prove as benefits to thee. For I will fight against my cankered country with the spleen of all the underfeeds. But if so be, thou... Darest not this, and that to prove more fortunes thou tired, then in a word I also am longer to live most weary, and present my throat to thee, and to thy ancient malice, which not to cut would show thee but a fool, since I have ever followed thee with hate, drawn tons of blood out of thy country's breast, and cannot live but to thy shame unless... It be to do thee service. Oh, Martius, Martius, each word thou hast spoke hath weeded from my heart a root of ancient envy. If Jupiter should from yon cloud speak divine things and say tis true, I'd not believe them more than thee. All noble Martius, let me twine mine arms about thy body, where against my grained ash an hundred times hath broke and scarred the moon with splinters. Here I clip the anvil of my sword, and do contest as hotly and as nobly with thy love as ever in ambitious strength I did contend against thy valour. Know thou first, I loved the maid I married, never man sighed truer breath. But that I see thee here, Thou noble thing, more dances my rapt heart than when I first my wedded mistress saw bestride my threshold. Why, thou Mars, I tell thee, we have a power on foot, and I had purpose once more to hew thy target from thy brawn or lose mine arm for it. Thou hast beat me out twelve several times, and I have nightly since dreamt of encounters twixt thyself and me. We have been down together in my sleep, unbuckling helms, fisting each other's throat, and wait half dead with nothing. Worthy Martius, had we no other quarrel else to roam but that thou art thence banished, we would muster all from twelve to seventy, and pouring war into the bowels of ungrateful Rome like a bold flood or beat. Oh, come, Go in, and take our friendly senators by the hands, who now are here, taking their leaves of me, who am prepared against your territories, though not for Rome itself. You bless me, gods. Therefore, most absolute sir, if thou wilt have the leading of thine own revenges, 
Take the one half of my commission and sit down, as best thou art experienced, since thou knowest thy country's strength and weakness, thine own ways, whether to knock against the gates of Rome or rudely visit them in parts remote to fright them ere destroy. But come in. Let me commend thee first to those that shall say yea to thy desires. <laughs> A thousand welcomes, and more a friend than e'er an enemy. Yet, Martius, that was much. Your hand, most welcome. <laughs> Here's a strange alteration. Oh, by my hand, I had thought to have struck in him with a cudgel, and yet my mind gave me his clothes made a false report of him. What an army he has. Mm. He turned me about with his finger and his thumb as one would set up a top. Nay. I knew by his face that there was something in him. Mm. He had, sir, a kind of face, methought. Oh, I cannot tell how to term it. He had so. Looking as it were, would I were hanged, but I thought there was more in him than I could think. Oh, so did I, I'll be sworn. He is simply the rarest man in the world. I think he is. But a greater soldier than he you wot on. Who, my master? Nay, it's no matter for that. What, six on him? <laughs> Nay, not so neither. But I take him to be the greater soldier. A faith, look you, one cannot tell how to say that. For the defence of a town, our general is excellent. Ah, and for an assault, too. <laughs> Slaves, I can tell you news, news, you rascals. What, what, what? Let's partake. Let's I partake. would not be a Roman of all nations. I had as lief be... A condemned man. Wherefore? Wherefore? Oh, why, here's he that was wont to thwack our general, Caius Martius. Why do you say thwack our general? Mm. I do not say thwack our general, but he was always good enough for him. Oh, come. We are fellows and friends. He was ever too hard for him. I have heard him say so himself. He was too hard for him directly to say the troth on. Before Coriolis, he scotched him and notched him like a carbonado. <laughs> and had he been cannibally given, he might have boiled and eaten him too. <laughs> but more of thy news. Why, he is so made on here within, mm. as if he was son and heir to Mars. <gasps> Set at upper end of the table. No mm. question asked him by any of the senators, <gasps> but they stand bald before him. <gasps> Our general himself makes a mistress of him. <gasps> Sanctifies himself with his hand and turns up the white of the eye to his discourse. <laughs> but the bottom of the news is, mm -hmm. our general is cut of the middle and but one half of what he was yesterday, oh? for the other has half by the entreaty and grant of the whole table. <gasps> He'll go, he says, and sow the porter of Rome gates by the ears. Oh. He will mow all down before him and leave his passage pole. And he's as like to do it as any man I can imagine. Do it? He will do it. For look you, sir, he has as many friends as enemies. Mm. Which friends, sir? as it were, does not look you, sir, show themselves, as we term it, mm. his friends whilst he's in directitude. Directitude? What's that? But when they shall see, sir, his crest up again and the man in blood, they will out of their burrows like conies after rain and revel all with him. But when goes this forward? Tomorrow. Mm. Oh. Today, presently, yeah. you shall have the drums struck up this afternoon. Oh. Tis, as it were, a parcel of their feast and to be executed ere they wipe their lips. Why, then we shall have a stirring world again. Mm -hmm. This piece is nothing but to rust iron, increase tailors and breed ballad makers. Let me have war, say I. Mm -hmm. It exceeds peace as far as day does night. Mm -hmm. It's sprightly, waking, audible and full of vent. Mm -hmm. Peace is a very apoplexy. Mm -hmm. Lethargy, mild, deaf, sleepy, insensible, a getter of more bastard children than war's a destroyer of men. Tis so. And as war in some sort may be said to be a ravisher, so it cannot be denied, but peace is a great maker of cuckolds. <laughs> Aye, and it makes men hate one another. Reason, because they then less need one another. The war's for my money. I hope to see Romans as cheap as Volsians. <laughs> <laughs> They are rising! They are rising! <laughs> <laughs> We hear not of him, neither need we fear him. His remedies are tame. The present peace and quietness of the people, which before were in wild hurry. Here do we make his friends blush that the world goes well, who rather had, though they themselves did suffer by it, behold dissentious numbers pestering streets, than see our tradesmen singing in their shops and going about their functions friendly. We stood to it in good time. Is this Meninius? Tis he, tis he. 
Oh, he has grown most kind of late. <laughs> Hail, sir. Hail to you both. Your Coriolanus is not much missed but with his friends. The Commonwealth doth stand, and so would do were he more angry at it. All's well, and might have been much better if he could have temporized. Where is he, hear you? Nay, I hear nothing. His mother and his wife hear nothing from him. The God's pity of you Good in, our neighbours. Good in to you all. Good in to you all. Our sons, our wives and children, on our knees are bound to pray for you both. Ah, live and thrive. Farewell, kind neighbours. We wished Coriolanus had loved you as we did. <laughs> farewell, farewell. <laughs> uh, this is a happier and more comely time than when these fellows ran about the streets crying confusion. Caius Martius was a worthy officer in the war, but insolent or come with pride, ambitious past all thinking, self-loving... And affecting one sole throne without assistance? I think not so. We should by this, to all our lamentation if he had gone forth consul, found it so. The gods have well prevented it. And Rome sits safe and still without him. Worthy tributes, there is a slave whom we have put in prison. Reports the vultures with two several powers are entered in the Roman territories, and with the deepest malice of the war destroy what lies before him. Tis Ophidius, who, hearing of our martius banishment, thrusts forth his horns again into the world, which were in shelled when Martius stood for Rome and durst not once peep out. Come, um, what talk you of Martius? Go see this rumour of whipped. It cannot be the Volsies dare break with us. Cannot be? <laughs> We have record that very well it can, and three examples of the like hath been within my age. But reason with the fellow before you punish him where he heard this, lest you shall chance to whip your information and beat the messenger who bids beware of what is to be dreaded. Tell not me, I know this cannot be. Not possible. The nobles in great earnestness are going all to the Senate House. Some news is coming that turns their countenances. Tis this slave! Go whip him for the people's eyes. He's raising nothing but his report. Yes, worthy sir, the slave's report is seconded, and more, more fearful is delivered. What more fearful? It is spoke freely out of many mouths, how probable I do not know, that Martius, joined with Orphidius, leads a power against Rome, and vows revenge as spacious as between the youngst and oldest thing. But this is most likely. Raised only that the weaker sort may wish good Martius home again. The very trick on. <laughs> This is unlikely. He and Ophidius can no more atone than violence to contrariety. You are sent for to the Senate. A fearful army led by Caius Martius associated with Ophidius rages upon our territories and have already overborne their way, consumed with fire, and took what lay before them. Oh, you have made good work. What news? What news? You have hoped to ravish your own daughters and to melt the city leads upon your pates, to see your wives dishonored to your noses. What's the news? Your What's the news? Your temples burned in their cement and your franchises whereon you stood confined into an augur's ball. Pray now, your news... You have made fair work, I fear me. Pray your news. If Martius should be joined with Volsians... If he is their god, he leads them like a thing made by some other deity than nature that shapes man better. And they follow him against us brats with no less confidence than boys pursuing summer butterflies or butchers killing flies. You have made good work, you and your apron men, you that stood so much upon the voice of occupation and the breath of garlic eaters. You shake your Rome about your ears. As Hercules did shake down mellow fruit, you have made fair work. But is this true, sir? Aye, and you'll look pale before you find it other. All the regions do smilingly revolt, and who resists are mocked for valiant ignorance and perish constant fools. Who is can blame him? Your enemies and his find something in him. We are all undone unless the noble man hath mercy. Who shall ask it? The tribunes cannot do it for shame. The people deserve such pity of him as the wolf does of the shepherds. For his best friends, if they should say, be good to Rome, they charged him even as those should do that had deserved his hate and therein showed like enemies. It is true. If he were putting to my house the brand that should consume it, I have not the face to say, beseech you cease. 
You have made fair hands, you and your crafts. You have crafted fair. You have brought a trembling upon Rome such as was never so incapable of help. Say, Say not we brought it. Must we? We loved him, but like beasts and cowardly nobles gave way unto your clusters, who did hoot him out of the city. But I fear they'll roar him in again. Tullus Ophidius, the second name of men, obeys his points as if he were his officer. Desperation is all the policy, strength, and defense that Rome can make against them. Here come the clusters. And is Ophidius with him? You are they that made the air unwholesome when you cast your stinking, greasy caps in hooting at Coriolanus' exile. Now he's coming, and not a hair upon a soldier's head which will not prove a whip. As many coxcombs as you threw caps up will he tumble down and pay you for your voices. Tis no matter. If he could burn us all into one coal, we have deserved it. Faith with your for mine own part, when I said banish him, I said twas pity. Uh, so did I, and so did I. And to say the truth, so did very many of us. That we did, we did for the best. And though we willingly consented to his banishment, yet it was against our will. Uh, your goodly things, you voices. You have made good work, you and your cry. Trust to the capital. Oh, I. What else? Go, masters, get you home. Be not dismayed. These are a side that would be glad to have this true, which they so seem to fear. Go home and show no sign of fear. Oh, the gods be good to us. Come, masters, let's home. I have a signal in the wrong when we banished him. So did we all. But come, let's home. <laughs> I do not like this news. Nor I. Let's to the capital. Would half my wealth would buy this for a lie. Pray, let us go. Do they still fly to the Roman? I do not know what witchcraft's in him, but your soldiers use him as the grace for meat, their talk at table and their thanks at end. And you are darkened in this action, sir, even by your own. I cannot help it now, unless by using means I'll aim the foot of our design. He bears himself more proudly, even to my person, than I thought he would when first I did embrace him. Yet his nature in that's no changeling, and I must excuse what cannot be amended. Yet I wish, sir, I mean for your particular, you had not joined in commission with him, but either had borne the action of yourself, or else to him had left it solely. I understand thee well. And be thou sure, when he shall come to his account, he knows not what I can urge against him. Although it seems, and so he thinks, and is no less apparent to the vulgar eye, that he bears all things fairly, and shows good husbandry for the Volscian state, fights dragon-like, and does achieve as soon as draw his sword, yet he hath left undone that which shall break his neck or hazard mine whene'er we come to our account. Sir, I beseech you, think you he'll carry Rome? All places yield to him ere he sits down, and the nobility of Rome are his. The senators and patricians love him too. The tribunes are no soldiers, and their people will be as rash in the repeal as hasty to expel him thence. I think he'll be to Rome as is the osprey to the fish, who takes it by sovereignty of nature. First he was a noble servant to them, but he could not carry his honours even. Whether twas pride, which out of daily fortune ever taints the happy man, whether defect of judgment to fail in the disposing of those chances which he was lord of, or whether nature, not to be other than one thing, not moving from the cask to the cushion, but commanding peace, even with the same austerity and garb as he controlled the war. But one of these, as he had spices of them all, not all, for I dare so far free him, made him feared, so hated and so banished. But he has a merit to choke it in the utterance. So, our virtues lie in the interpretation of the time, and power, unto itself most commendable, hath not a tomb so evident as a chair to extol what it hath done. One fire drives out one fire, one nail, one nail. Rights by rights founder, strengths by strengths do fail. Come, let's away. When, Caius, Rome is thine, Thou art poorest of all, then shortly art thou mine. (laughs) 
No, I'll not go. You hear what he hath said, which was sometime his general, who loved him in a most dear particular. He called me father, but what of that? Go you that banished him, a mile before his tent, fall down and knee the way into his mercy. Nay, if he quite to hear Cominius speak, I'll keep at home. He would not seem to know me. Do you hear? Yet one time he did call me by my name. I urged our old acquaintance and the drops that we have bled together. Coriolanus he would not answer to, forbade all names. He was a kind of nothing, titleless, till he had forged himself a name of the fire of burning Rome. My son, you have made good work, a pair of tribunes that have racked for Rome to make coals cheap, a noble memory. I minded him how royal it was to pardon when it was less expected. He replied, it was a bare petition of a state to one whom they had punished. Very well, could he say less? I offered to awaken his regard for his private friends. His answer to me was he could not stay to pick them in a pile of noisome, musty chaff. He said twas folly for one poor grain or two to leave unburnt and still to nose the offence. For one poor grain or two, I am one of those. His mother, wife, his child, and this brave fellow to we are the grains. You are the musty chaff, and you are smelt above the moon. We must be burnt for you. Nay, pray be patient. If you refuse your aid in this so never needed help, yet do not upbraids with our distress. But sure, if you would be your country's pleader, your good tongue, more than the instant army we can make, might stop our countrymen. No, I'll not meddle. Pray you, go to him. What should I do? Only make trial what your love can do for Rome toward Martius. Well, and say that Martius returned me as Cominius is returned, unheard. What then? But as a discontented friend, grief shot with his unkindness. Say it be so. Yet your good will must have that thanks from Rome. After the measure as you intended, well. Oh. I'll undertake it. I think he'll hear me. Yet to bite his lip and hum at good Cominius much unhearts me. He was not taken well. He had not dined. The veins unfilled, our blood is cold, and then we pout upon the morning, are unapt to give or to forgive. But when we have stuffed these pipes and these conveyances of our blood with wine and feeding, we have suppler souls than in our priest-like fasts. <laughs> Therefore, I'll watch him till he be dieted to my request, and then I'll set upon him. You know the very road into his kindness, and cannot lose your way. <laughs> Good faith, I'll prove him. Speed how it will. I shall ere long have knowledge of my success. You'll never hear him. Not? I tell you, he does sit in gold, his eye red as twould burn Rome, and his injury the jailer to his pity. I kneeled before him. Twas very faintly, he said, rise. Dismissed me thus with his speechless hand. What he would do, he sent in writing after me. What he would not bound with an oath to yield to his conditions, so that all hope is vain. Unless his noble mother and his wife, who, as I hear, mean to solicit him for mercy to his country, therefore let's hence, and with our fair entreaties, haste them on. Whence are ye? Stand and go back. You guard like men, tis well. But by your leave, I am an officer of state and come to speak with Coriolanus. From whence? From Rome. You may not pass. 
You must return. Our general will no more hear from thence. You'll see your Rome embraced with fire before you'll speak with Coriolanus. Good, my friends. If you have heard your general talk of Rome and of his friends there, it is lots to blanks. My name hath touched your ears. It is Menenius. Be it so. Go back. The virtue of your name is not here passable. I tell thee, fellow, thy general is my lover. I have been the book of his good acts, whence men have read his fame unparalleled, haply amplified, for I have ever verified my friends of whom he's chief, with all the size that verity would without lapsing suffer. Nay, sometimes, like to a bowl upon a subtle ground, I have tumbled past the throw, and in his praise have almost stamped the leasing. Therefore, fellow, I must have leave to pass. Faith, sir, if you had told as many lies in his behalf as you have uttered words in your own, you should not pass here. No, though it were as virtuous to lie as to live chastely. Therefore, go back. Prithee, fellow, remember, my name is Menenius, always factionary on the party of your general. Howsoever you have been his liar, as you say you have, I am one that, telling true under him, must say you cannot pass, therefore go back. As he dined, canst thou tell? For I would not speak with him till after dinner. <laughs> you are a Roman, are you? I am, as thy general is. Then you should hate Rome as he does. Can you, when you have pushed out your gates, the very defender of them, and in a violent popular ignorance, given your enemy your shield, think to front his revenges with the easy groans of old women, the virginal palms of your daughters, or with the palsied intercession of such a decayed dotant as you seem to be? Can you think to blow out the intended fire your city is ready to flame in with such weak breath as this? No, you are deceived. Therefore, back to Rome and prepare for your execution. You are condemned. Our general has sworn you out of reprieve and pardon. Sir, if my captain knew I were here, he would use me with estimation. Come, my captain knows you not. I mean thy general. My general cares not for you. Back, I say. Go, lest I let forth your half pint of blood. Back. That's the utmost of your having. Back. Hey, but fellow, fellow, what's the matter? Now, you companion, I say an errand for you. You shall know now that I am in estimation. You shall perceive that a Jack Gardent cannot office me from my son, Coriolanus. Yes, but by my entertainment with him. If thou standst not in the state of hanging or of some death more long in spectatorship and crueler in suffering, behold now presently and swooned for what's to come upon thee. The glorious gods sit in hourly synod about thy particular prosperity and love thee no worse than thy old father Menenius does. Oh, my son, my son, thou art preparing fire for us. Look thee, here's water to quench it. I was hardly moved to come to thee, but being assured none but myself could move thee. I have been blown out of our gates with sighs, and conjure thee to pardon Rome and thy petitionary countrymen. The good gods assuage thy wrath, and turn the dregs of it upon this varlet here, this who, like a block, hath denied my access to thee. Away. Ah, oh. Ampoy? Wife, mother, child, I know not. My affairs are servanted to others. Though I owe my revenge properly, my remission lies in vulsion breasts. That we have been familiar, in great forgetfulness shall poison rather than pity note how much, therefore be gone. Mine ears against your suits are stronger than your gates against my force. Yet, for I loved thee... Take this along, I writ it for thy sake, and would have sent it. <laughs> Another word, Menenius, I will not hear thee speak. This man, Ophidius, was my beloved in Rome, yet thou beholdst. You keep a constant temper. Now, sir, is your name Menenius? Tis a spell, you see, of much power. 
You know the way home again. Do you hear how we are shent for keeping your greatness back? What cause do you think I have to swoon? I neither care for the world nor your general. For such things as you, I can scarce think there's any you're so slight. He that hath a will to die by himself fears it not from another. Let your general do his worst. For you be that you are long, and your misery increase with your age. I say to you, as I was said to, away. A noble fellow, I warrant him. Now the worthy fellow is our general. He's the rock, the oak, not to be wind-shaken. We will, before the walls of Rome tomorrow, set down our host. My partner in this action, you must report to the Volscian lords how plainly I have borne this business. Only their ends you have respected. Stopped your ears against the general suit of Rome. Never admitted a private whisper. No, not with such friends that thought them sure of you. This last old man, whom with a cracked heart I have sent to Rome, loved me above the measure of a father. Nay, godded me indeed. Their latest refuge was to send him, for whose old love I have, though I showed sourly to him, once more offered the first conditions, which they did refuse and cannot now accept, to grace him only, that thought he could do more, a very little I have yielded to. Fresh embassies and suits, nor from the state, nor private friends, hereafter will I lend ear to. Ah, what shout is this? Shall I be tempted to infringe my vow in the same time tis made? I will not. My wife comes foremost, then the honoured mould wherein this trunk was framed, and in her hand the grandchild to her blood, but out affection, all bond and privilege of nature, break. Let it be virtuous to be obstinate, what is that curtsy worth, or those doves' eyes which can make gods forsworn? I melt, and am not of stronger earth than others. My mother bows, as if Olympus to a molehill should in supplication nod, and my young boy hath an aspect of intercession which great nature cries, Deny not! Let the Volsces plough Rome and harrow Italy! I'll never be such a gosling to obey instinct, but stand as if a man were author of himself and knew no other kin. My lord and husband... These eyes are not the same I wore in Rome. The sorrow that delivers us thus changed makes you think so. Like... A dull actor now, I have forgot my part, and I am out even to a full disgrace. Best of my flesh, forgive my tyranny. But do not say for that, forgive our Romans. Oh, a kiss. Long as my exile, sweet as my revenge. Ah, by the jealous queen of heaven, that kiss I carried from thee, dear, and my true lip hath virgined it e'er since. You gods, I prayed, and the most noble mother of the world leave unsaluted. Oh, sink my knee in the earth. Of thy deep duty, more impression show than that of common sons. Oh, stand up, blessed. Whilst with no softer cushion than the flint, I kneel before thee. And unproperly show duty is mistaken all this while between the child and parent. What is this? Your knees to me, to your corrected son. Then let the pebbles on the hungry beach fill it the stars... Then let the mutinous winds strike the proud cedars against the fiery sun, murdering impossibility to make what cannot be slight work. Thou art my warrior. I hope to frame thee. Do you know this lady? The noble sister of Publicola, 
the moon of Rome, chaste as the icicle that's curded by the frost from purest snow and hangs on Dian's temple, dear Valeria. This is a poor epitome of yours, which, by the interpretation of full time, may show like all yourself. The god of soldiers, with the consent of supreme Jove, inform thy thoughts with nobleness that thou mayst prove to shame unvulnerable and stick in the wars like a great sea mark, standing every floor and saving those that eye thee. Me, Sarah. That's my brave boy. Even he, your wife, this lady and myself are suitors to you. I beseech you peace. Or if you'd ask, remember this before. The thing I have forsworn to grant may never be held by you denials. Do not bid me dismiss my soldiers or capitulate again with Rome's mechanics. Tell me not wherein I seem unnatural. Desire not to lay my rages and revenges with your colder reasons. Oh, no more, no more. You have said you will not grant us anything. For we have nothing else to ask but that which you deny already, yet we will ask that if you fail in our request, the blame may hang upon your hardness. Therefore, hear us. Ophidius, and you will seize Mark, for we'll hear naught from Rome in private. Your request. Should we be silent and not speak, our raiment and state of bodies would bewray what life we have led since thy exile. Think with thyself, how more unfortunate than all living women are we come hither. Since that thy sight which should make our eyes flow with joy, hearts dance with comforts, constrains them weep and shake with fear and sorrow, making the mother, wife, and child to see the son, the husband, and the father tearing his country's bowels out. And to poor we thine enmities most capital. Thou barrest us our prayers to the gods, which is a comfort that all but we enjoy. For how can we, alas, how can we for our country pray, whereto we are bound, together with thy victory, whereto we are bound? Alack, or we must lose the country, our dear nurse, or else thy person, our comfort in the country. We must find an evident calamity, though we had our wish which side should win. For either thou must, as a foreign recreant, be led with manacles through our streets, or else triumphantly tread on thy country's ruin and bear the palm for having bravely shed thy wife and children's blood. For myself, son, I purpose not to wait on fortune till these wars determine. If I cannot persuade thee rather to show a noble grace to both parts than seek the end of one, thou shalt no sooner march to assault thy country than to tread... Trust to it thou shalt not, on thy mother's womb that brought thee to this world. I and mine, that brought you forth this boy to keep your name living to time. I shall not tread on me. I'll run away till I am bigger, but then I'll fight. Not of a woman's tenderness to be requires, nor child, nor woman's face to see. I have sat too long. Nay, go not from us thus. If it were so that our request did tend to save the Romans thereby to destroy the Volsces whom you serve, you might condemn us as poisonous of your honour. No, our suit is that you reconcile them, while the Volsces may say, this mercy we have showed, the Romans, this we received, and each in either side give the all hail to thee and cry, be blessed for making up this peace. Thou knowest, great son, the end of war's uncertain, but this certain, that if thou conquer Rome, the benefit which thou shalt thereby reap is such a name whose repetition will be dogged with curses, whose chronicle thus writ, the man was noble, but with his last attempt he wiped it out, destroyed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age abhorred. Speak to me, son. Thou hast affected the fine strains of honour to imitate the graces of the gods, to tear with thunder the wide cheeks of the air, and yet to change thy sulphur with a bolt that should but rive an oak. Why dost not speak? Think'st thou it honourable for a noble man still to remember wrongs? 
Daughter, speak you! He cares not for your weeping. Speak thou, boy, perhaps thy childishness will move him more than can our reasons. There's no man in the world more bound to his mother, yet here he lets me prate like one of the stocks. Thou hast never in thy life showed thy dear mother any courtesy. When she, poor hen, fond of no second brood, has clucked thee to the wars and safely home, loaden with honour. Say my request unjust and spurn me back. But if it be not so, thou art not honest, and the gods will plague thee that thou restrainest from me the duty which to a mother's part belongs. He turns away. Down, ladies! Let us shame him with our knees. To his surname, Coriolanus longs more pride than pity to our prayers. Down! An end! This is the last. So we will home to Rome and die among our neighbours. Nay, behold, this boy, that cannot tell what he would have, but kneels and holds up hands for fellowship, does reason our petition with more strength than thou hast to deny it. Come, let us go. This fellow had a votion to his mother. His wife is in Coriolis, and this child like him by John. <laughs> Yet give us our dispatch. I am hushed until our city be a fire. <laughs> Then I speak a little. Oh, mother, mother, what have you done? Behold, the heavens do ope, the gods look down. And this unnatural scene they laugh at. Oh, my mother. Mother. Oh, you have won a happy victory to Rome. But for your son, believe it. Oh, believe it. Most dangerously you have with him prevailed. If not most mortal to him. But let it go. Come, Ophidius, though I cannot make true wars, I'll frame convenient peace. Now, good Ophidius, were you in my stead, would you have heard a mother less or granted less, Ophidius? I was moved withal. I dare be sworn you were. And, sir, it is no little thing to make mine eyes to sweat compassion, but, good sir... What peace you'll make, advise me. For my part, I'll not to Rome. I'll back with you, and pray you, stand to me in this cause. Oh, mother, wife! <laughs> <laughs> I am glad thou hast set thy mercy and thy honour difference in thee. Out of that I'll work myself a former fortune. Aye, by and by. But we will drink together. And you shall bear a better witness back than words which we, on like conditions, will have countersealed. Come, enter with us. Ladies, you deserve to have a temple built you. All the swords in Italy and her confederate arms could not have made this peace. See you, yon coin of the capital, yon cornerstone. Why, what of that? If it be possible for you to displace it with your little finger, there is some hope the ladies of Rome, especially his mother, may prevail with him. But I say there is no hope in it. Our throats are sentenced and stay upon execution. Is it possible that so short a time can alter the condition of a man? There is difference between a grub and a butterfly, yet your butterfly was a grub. This Martius is grown from man to dragon. He has wings 
Jesus. He's more than a creeping thing. He loved his mother dearly. So did he me, and he no more remembers his mother now than an eight-year-old horse. The tartness of his face sours ripe grapes. When he walks, he moves like an engine, and the ground shrinks before his treading. He is able to pierce a corslet with his eye, talks like a knell, and his hum is a battery. He sits in his skate as a thing made for Alexander. What he bids be done is finished with his bidding. He wants nothing of a god but eternity and a heaven to throne in. Yes, mercy, if you report him truly. I paint him in the character. Mark what mercy his mother shall bring from him. There is no more mercy in him than there is milk in a male tiger. That shall our poor city find, and all this is long of you. The gods be good unto us. No, in such a case the gods will not be good unto us. When we banished him, we respected not them. And he, returning to break our necks, they respect uh, not us. If you'd save your life, fly to your house. The plebeians have got your fellow tribune, and hail him up and down, all swearing if the Roman ladies bring not comfort home, they'll give him death by inches. What's the news? Good news, good news. The ladies have prevailed. The Volscians are dislodged and Martius gone. Oh, and many a day did never yet greet Rome. No, not the expulsion of the Tarquins. Friend, art thou certain this is true? Is most certain? As certain as I know the sun is fire. Where have you lurked that you make doubt of it? Ne'er through an arch so hurried the blown tide as the recomforted through the gates. Why, hark you! The trumpets, sackbuts, psalteries, and fifes, tabors and cymbals, and the shouting Romans make the sun dance. Hark you! This is good news. I will go meet the ladies. This Valumnia is worth of consuls, senators, patricians, a city full, of tribunes such as you, a sea and land full. You have prayed well today. This morning, for 10,000 of your throats, I'd not have given a doit. Hark, how they joy! First, the gods bless you for your tidings. Next, accept my thankfulness. Sir, we have all great cause to give great thanks. They are near the city, almost a point to enter. We will meet them and help the joy. Behold our patroness, the life of Rome. Call all your tribes together. Praise the gods and make triumphant fires. Strew flowers before them. Unshout the noise that banished Martius. Repeal him with the welcome of his mother. Cry, welcome, ladies. Welcome. Tell the lords of the city I am here. Deliver them this paper. Having read it, bid them repair to the marketplace, where I, even in theirs and in the commons' ears, will vouch the truth of it. Him I accuse. The city ports by this hath entered and intends to appear before the people, hoping to purge himself with words. Dispatch. Most welcome. How is it with our general? Even so, as with a man by his own arms empoisoned and with his charity slain. Most noble sir, if you do hold the same intent wherein you wished us parties, we'll deliver you of your great danger. Sir, I cannot tell. We must proceed as we do find the people. The people will remain uncertain whilst twixt you there's difference. But the fall of either makes the survivor heir of all. I know it. And my pretext to strike at him admits a good construction. I raised him. And I pawned mine honour for his truth, who being so heightened, he watered his new plants with dews of flattery, seducing so my friends. And to this end, he bowed his nature, never known before but to be rough, unswayable, and free. Sir, his stoutness, when he did stand for consul, which he lost by lack of stupid. That I would have spoke of. Being banished for it, he came unto my hearth, presented to my knife his throat. I took him. Made him joint servant with me, gave him way in all his own desires. Nay, let him choose out of my files his projects to accomplish. 
my best and freshest men, served his desirements in mine own person, hoped to reap the fame which he did end all his, and took some pride to do myself this wrong, till at the last I seemed his follower, not partner, and he waged me with his countenance as if I had been mercenary. So he did, my lord. The army marvelled at it. And in the last, when he had carried Roman, that we looked for no less spoil than glory. There was it, for which my sinew shall be stretched upon him. At a few drops of women's room, which are as cheap as lies, he sowed the blood and labour of our great action. Therefore shall he die, and I'll renew me in his fall. But hark. Your native town you entered like a post and had no welcomes home. But he returns, splitting the air with noise. Patient fools whose children he hath slain, their base throats tear with giving him glory. Therefore, at your vantage, shall he express himself or move the people with what he would say? Let him feel your sword, which we will second. When he lies along, after your way his tale pronounced, shall bury his reasons with his body. Say no more. Here come the lords. The most welcome home. I have not deserved it. But, worthy laws, have you with heed perused what I have written to you? Yeah, we have. And grieved to hear it. What faults he made before the last, I think, might have found easy fines. But there to end where he was to begin, and give away the benefit of our levies, answering us with our own charge, making a treaty where there was a yielding, this admits no excuse. He approaches. You shall hear him. No more infected with my country's love than when I parted hence, but still subsisting under your great command. You are to know that prosperously I have attempted and with bloody passage led your wars even to the gates of Rome. <laughs> Our spoils we have brought home do more than counterpoise a full third part the charges of the action. We have made peace with no less honour to the Antiates than shame to the Romans. And we here deliver, subscribed by the consuls and patricians, together with the seal of the Senate, what we have compounded on. Yay! Read it not, noble lords. But tell the traitor in the highest degree he hath abused your power. Traitor! How now? I, traitor Martius. Martius! I, Martius. Caius Martius. Dost thou think I'll grace thee with that robbery, thy stolen name, Coriolanus in Coriolis? You lords and heads of the state, perfidiously he has betrayed your business and given up for certain drops of salt. Your city, Rome. I say... Your city to his wife and mother, breaking his oath and resolution like a twist of rotten silk, never admitting counsel of the war, but at his nurse's tears, he whined and roared away your victory, that pages blushed at him, and men of heart looked wondering each at other. Hearst thou, Mars! Name not the god, thou boy of tears! Ha! No more! Measureless liar! Thou hast made my heart too great for what contains it. Boy! Oh, slave! Pardon me, lords. Tis the first time that ever I was forced to scold. Your judgments, my grave lords, must give this cur the lie, and his own notion, who wears my stripes impressed upon him, that must bear my beating to his grave, shall join to thrust the lie unto him. Peace, both, and hear me speak. Cut me to pieces, Volsies. Men and lads, stain all your edges on me. Boy, false hound, if you have writ your annals true, tis there, that like an eagle in a dovecot, I fluttered your vulsions in Coriolis. Alone I did it. Boy! Why, noble lords, will you be put in mind of his blind fortune, which was your shame, by this unholy braggart for your own eyes and ears? Let him die for us! Tear him Don't to pieces! Oh, my Peace! How? No outrage! Peace! The man is noble, and his fame falls in this orb of the earth. 
His last defenses to us shall have judicious hearing. Stand, Orphidius, and trouble not the peace. Oh, that I had him with six Orphidiuses or more, his tribe, to use my lawful sword. Insolent villain. Kill him. Oh, oh, kill him. Oh, kill him. Oh, kill him. My noble masters, hear me speak. Oh, Tullus, thou hast done a deed where that valor will weep. Tread not upon him. Masters all, be quiet. Put up your swords. My lords, when you shall know, as in this rage provoked by him you cannot, the great danger which this man's life did owe you, your rejoice that he is thus cut off. Please it your honors to call me to your senate. I'll deliver myself your loyal servant, or endure your heaviest censure. Bear from hence his body, and mourn you for him. Let him be regarded as the most noble course that ever Herald did follow to his urn. His own impatience takes from Morphidius a great part of blame. Let's make the best of it. My rage is gone, and I am struck with sorrow. Take him up. Help, three of the chiefest soldiers. I'll be one. Be thou the drum, that it speak mournfully. Trail your steel pikes. Though in this city he hath widowed and unchilded many a one, which to this hour bewail the injury, yet he shall have a noble memory. Assist. Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. Paul Jessen played Coriolanus. Ewan Hooper, Meninius, and Marjorie Yates, Volumnia. Michael N. Harbour was Cominius. Martin Marquez, Orphidius. Dennis Hawthorne, Sicinius. Steve Hodson, Brutus. And Anthony Jackson, Titus Lartius. The first citizen was Michael Higgs. The second citizen, Jonathan Taffler. First senator, Trevor Martin. Second senator, Jamie Glover, and the first Coriolis citizen, Philip Bretherton. Virgilia was Sarah Woodward, Valeria, Shirley Dixon, first soldier, Chris Luscombe, Coriolis messenger, Mark Bonner, and the young Coriolanus, Freddie Norton. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The musicians were Paul Bevan on euphonium, Mike Mower, on tenor saxophone, Tom Hammond, Dennis Rowlands, Abigail Newman, and Adam Wolfe, trombones, Adrian Woodward, trumpet, Phil Hopkins and Michael Gregory, percussion. The music was composed and conducted by Dominique Lejeune. Coriolanus was directed by Clive Brill.